The Final Reckoning, Book Three of the Depth of Mice Trilogy by Robin Jarvis, read by John Pertwee. The old empty house in Deptford looked blankly out of the wet, wintry world. The neglected building was the home of many mice, but only at special times of the year would they all come together to celebrate the various mouse festivals. There was the great spring ceremony, where mouse brasses were given out to those young mice who'd come of age. There was Midsummer's Eve, a particularly magical time, and finally there was the festival of Yule. Yule occurs in the midst of winter, when cold storms batter and rage outside. For many long years, mice have gathered together during Yule and lit fires to keep the ravening spirits of cold and ice away. They feel themselves to be particularly vulnerable during this season because the green mouse, their protector and symbol of life, is dead. Every autumn, when the harvest has been taken in and the last fruit falls from the trees, the great green mouse dwindles and dies. Throughout the long, dark winter months, his spirit is neither felt nor seen as death binds him close. And only when the first sign of spring appears is he reborn once more. It is through these bleak, dangerous months that mice have to survive, and those who dwell out of doors dread it. In the skirtings, however, Yule was much looked forward to. The seriousness and the danger of the season had been forgotten, and Yule had become a time of feasting and the telling of ghost stories. This year the hall had been decked out with sprigs of evergreen and bright streamers which some of the children had made. A large roof slate, specially kept for the occasion, had been hauled out of the cupboard where it was stored. This they put down in the centre of the hall and built a fire over it. That night all the mice, of both the skirtings and the landings, were gathered round the crackling flames, warming their paws and listening to tales. Some were cleaning their whiskers, wondering if they ought to make another attack on the feast nearby, while others were dozing contentedly, musing on things past and long ago. Arthur and his sister Audrey had been back in the skirtings for two months now after their adventures in the country. On their return home, Arthur and Audrey had found that Thomas Triton, the stout, retired midship mouse, had been looking after their mother while they'd been away and had taken to calling her Gwen. Gwen Brown still addressed the midship mouse as Mr Triton, but she said it with a growing warmth that Arthur and Audrey had not heard since their father had died. Uh, where's Audrey? asked Oswald, the young albino mouse, staring at everyone gathered round the fire. Arthur shrugged. Oh, in her room, I suppose. Oh, she said she'd come down, but, uh, well, you know what she's like. Uh, since we've been back, she's got worse. Don't join in anything and hardly eats. Uh, her mother worries about her. Uh, do, you, do you think she misses Twit? ventured Oswald. Arthur shook his head. No, no, I told you it, it wasn't like that. Uh, Twit only married Audrey to save her from getting hanged. Uh, there was nothing else for it. Alone in her room, Audrey fiddled with the ribbon in her paws. She'd not yet tied it in her hair and was staring down at it dumbly. After the terrors of Fennywold, she'd found life in the skirtings very dull and the nosiness of several mice had irritated her no end. The sound of a whisker fiddle filtered into the room and gradually brought her round. She decided it was time to join the festivities, so she tied the ribbon in her hair, slipped her silver bell onto her tail and jumped off the bed. In the hall, the fire was still crackling merrily, and across the room, Audrey saw her mother talking to Thomas Triton. Ah, oh, there you are, Audrey, smiled Gwen Brown. Uh, have you had anything to eat yet? The girl shook her head and moved closer to her mother's side. Gwen put her arms around her daughter. Uh, Audrey, love, you haven't eaten properly since you came back from Fennywold. Uh, do have something. There's a big bowl of lovely soup over there. Audrey took a biscuit and nibbled at it as she watched everyone enjoying themselves. Her mind went back to earlier in the year when the young grey mouse in the city, Piccadilly, had been staying with the Browns. Audrey missed him. Algy and Mr Cockle struck up a dancing jig, 
and the mice formed a great ring and began to dance around the fire. Thomas dragged Gwen and Audrey into the dance, and soon everyone was out of breath. It was surprising how nimble Thomas Triton was. His white, wispy hair glowed like fine gold before the fire, and those same flames picked out the vibrant chestnut glint in the hair of Gwen Brown. Audrey was astonished to find herself admiring them as a couple. She wondered if her mother would marry the midship mouse. Both were lonely, and Audrey felt that her late father would approve. The music gradually slowed, and the fire became a mound of glowing embers. Right, I'll be off to my ship, said Thomas as he took leave of Gwen. He pulled on his blue woolen hat, and he went down into the cellar, where he passed through the grill and took the shortcut to Greenwich via the sewers. The city mice were highly organised. They lived in a rambling system of tunnels, which was collectively known as Holborn. It was an ancient civilization with strict rules and customs to obey. Those who dwelt in Holborn were governed by the great Thane. He was a venerable mouse, whose family had ruled for centuries. Beneath him, in importance, were the ministers. They were mice who excelled at organization, and all had their own different guilds to run. The Minister of Dwellings supervised the digging of new tunnels when the need arose, and allotted empty homes to the needy, who would join the Holborners from time to time. There was the Minister of Craft, who taught the children in a large, spacious chamber. There they learnt everything they could in order to survive life in the harsh city. The Minister for Supplies was concerned with the gathering of food and other useful items, all of which were distributed so that everyone had their fair share. The quick-witted, nimble mice were allocated to him to go into the foraging parties. Piccadilly walked down the underground platform, swinging his sack in one paw. All that week he'd been assigned a group of cadets. These were young, brassless mice, new to the work, and he was enjoying their company. A one of them, Marty, was a sensitive youngster. He had large brown eyes and a fine long nose with constantly twitching whiskers, and down his back there was an unusual dark mark in his fur, like a flash of lightning. Although Marty was grey like all the other city mice, he strongly reminded Piccadilly of Oswald, and more than once this week he had absent-mindedly called him Whitey. He often thought about those times in Deptford, and the good friends that he'd left there. He sighed sadly. If only Audrey had liked him. Oh, well, that part of his life was over now, and he just had to forget it. He hoped that one day he'd be able to remember without it hurting any more. As he and Marty made their way down the tunnel, Piccadilly gradually became aware of two small points of light shining down in the darkness where the tube tracks lay and it's only when the lights blinked that he realised they were eyes. It gave him a shock. But when he recovered, he shouted sternly, Here! Well, who's that down there? Come on! Come on, come out now! The eyes vanished, as whoever it was turned tail and ran away. Oh, no, you don't! yelled Piccadilly, leaping off the platform. He landed between the tracks, and he set off in pursuit. Whoever he was chasing was quick on their feet and scampered swiftly into the extreme blackness of the tunnel. All he could make out was a hunched, furry shape, dodging to and fro with a thin, knobbly tail slithering over the never-ending silvery rails. Piccadilly lengthened his strides, leaping over the wooden sleepers and ignoring the sharp pain of the gravel beneath his feet. Slowly he began to gain on his quarry. With outstretched paws, he caught hold of the clammy tail which lashed about before him. <coughs> squeaked a croaky voice as Piccadilly gave the tail a sharp yank. There was a loud clang as the unseen creature lost its balance and fell heavily against one of the rails. Oh, oh, oh me egg! whined the voice morosely. Oh, it hurts! Oh, oh, I eat. Oh. Piccadilly strained his eyes in the darkness to see what he'd caught. An old brown rat lay on the ground before him. His thin, chiselled face was crossed with 
many wrinkles, and the fur round his temples was grey. The rat was nursing his head and uttering indignant cries through gummy lips. There was only one tooth in his head. What, 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 the, what the places did, did you do that for? He squeaked woefully. Oh, I didn't do nought. Piccadilly eyed him carefully. There'd been some unpleasant rumours going round Holborn lately about the city rats. Piccadilly thought this might be a good time to find the answers to a few questions. Yeah, what are you spying on me for? he asked sharply. The rat mumbled to itself and folded its arms sulkily. Oh, I've got a sore head now, it said stubbornly. Oh, get a lump there, Mark will. It hates lumps, he does. Lump, lump, lump. Barker always gets them. He gets them from you. You, 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 you Barker might, might, might as well punch yourself to save you and them to bother. Piccadilly groaned. He could not stand whingers. Hey, are you called Barker then? He asked. There was no reply. Is your name Barker? The rat looked away rudely and remained obstinately where he was. Oh, lump, lump, lump he grumbled peevishly. Get up or I'll give you some more lumps to worry about, warned Piccadilly, losing his temper. Immediately the rat sprang to his feet. Barker, go now, he grunted. You're not so fast, mate, Piccadilly caught hold of the rat's furs. You haven't said why you were spying on me. Oh, well, I was just, I was just watching us all. We weren't, weren't doing no harm. Barker's all right, he is. He ain't got nothing not to do with the new blood. At this, Piccadilly raised his eyebrows and decided that he would learn more from this old rat. Here, are you hungry? he asked. Barker's eyes lit up, and he nodded hurriedly whilst rubbing his stomach. Yes, he wailed sorrowfully. Barker's, Barker's not, not eaten for days, and, and never only a, a mangy bit of orange peel. He, he saw Mousy Boy's sack of nosh, and, and that's why he was staring, you see. Come on, then. Piccadilly began to walk down the tunnel once more. I'll see what I can spare. Barker smacked his gums together and followed warily. His bright little eyes flicked this way and that, but always returned to the grey mouse in front of him, watching for any sudden movement or sign of danger. When they were out of the tunnel... Piccadilly climbed onto the platform. Barker, he began carefully. What did you mean before when you spoke of new blood? The rat clapped a paw over his wizened mouth as though frightened by what he'd let slip and refused to say anything more. Piccadilly casually tapped the sack with his paw and the meaning was not lost on his companion. The rat lowered his head and swiveled his beady eyes nervously. In a rasping whisper, he said to Piccadilly, um, well, them's the new blood, you see. They, they make Barker's life a misery because he, cause he won't join in. I mean, a pinch his dinner, they do, these scumbags. And when he complains, they, they, they give Barker head lumps. They're not nice rat folk, they're, they're dangerous, they are. Yeah, you, you, you stay away from them, mousy boy. Piccadilly listened to the old rat's words and considered them carefully. There had to be a reason for this unwelcome change in the attitude of the city rats. Where were they getting this new frowned bravery from? He asked this of Barker, and the old rat was in no doubt. Eh, oh, Stumpy it is, he whispered, shivering. He's not like us. He stirs up the rat lads and, and he makes them bad. <laughs> tells them wicked stuff and, and mixes things up good and proper. Oh, Stumpy, murmured Piccadilly, and something stirred in his memory, an unpleasant, ugly thought. He leaned forward urgently. Tell me, he insisted, tell me about old Stumpy. Where did he come from? Barker quivered all over, and his scraggy ears drooped with fear. Oh, I can't. He refused, shaking his head violently. No, uh, Barker, tell now to let it. <coughs> Them's big secrets. Uh, none must tell. None, none. Piccadilly fished in his sack 
and brought out a biscuit. Eagerly, Barker grabbed it and said hastily, um, he, Him come some months back. He, he, he said he come from... What's all this thing? A strange voice called out from the darkness of the tracks. Barker leapt in the air and his face was stricken with terror. He dropped the biscuit and he covered his face. Piccadilly and Marty watched as four claws came over to the edge of the platform. Then two great ugly rat heads peer over and glared at the whimpering Barker. One of the rats was brown in colour with matted, slimy fur from which a, a terrible smell issued. He had low, prominent brows and a slightly piggish snout from which two snotty rivers ran. The other rat was very fat and his black fur was dusty. He was chewing a piece of fluff-covered nougat and so he didn't speak for some time. The brown, smelly one scowled at Barker and gave a sneering grin to Piccadilly. Well, evening, grey boots, he said. Is balmy Barker been bothering ya? Huh? Piccadilly did not like the look of these two rats. They were far too sure of themselves. Ah, oh, what's it to you, Stinky? he asked cheekily. The rat blinked his red-rimmed eyes and chose to ignore the insult. Instead, he turned back to Barker. Right then. Now, you old pork's bag, what have you been saying to your young friend here, eh? Eh? Barker backed away and yelled, Oh, I ain't said nothing, honest lads. No, but Barker, he never says nothing to nobody. The brown rat snarled, and Barker yelped with fright. Uh, now then, pretty boy, sneered the rat, turning his attention back to Piccadilly. Whatever that old sot's been saying, you best forget it, Proto. Why should I, Pongo? The rat growled, and his claws scraped along the platform, making an unpleasant screeching sound. Uh, the name's Smith, boy. Smith. You do well to remember that. Well, who's the lord? He's stuffing his face, inquired Piccadilly, smiling. Him? Uh, he's known as Kelly. He don't talk much. Only opens his gob when there's something tasty to eat. <laughs> At this point, Kelly opened his mouth and proudly showed his sharpened teeth. He looked at Piccadilly in a most disturbing, hungry way. You shouldn't go believing what Barker tells you, said Smith nastily. Uh, Cause he ain't all there, I have Barker, old chum. Barker looked across at Smith with tearful eyes. Uh, here, tell this nice young mousy why we call you Barker. Barker dithered, not knowing what to do. Tell him, snapped Smith. We calls you Barker because... Uh, uh, because he... Barker's nose dribbled with his tears as he wept. Because, uh, uh, because, because I'm barking mad. Piccadilly watched them, the face like stone. Oh, I don't think that's very funny, he said sternly. Tormenting someone weaker than yourself? Oh, that's downright cowardly. Smith drew his breath sharply. Well... You are a nasty, rude little mouse, ain't ya? Yeah, I think we ought to teach you a few manners. He pulled himself up onto the platform and licked his teeth in anticipation. Piccadilly sprang to his feet and his paw flew to the small knife at his waist. Just you try it, he replied. Smith drew closer. But just then, Kelly spoke for the first time. Leave the tow rag, Smith. You know our orders? None of that stuff that he says so. Yeah, but I want him now. Well, you can't. For a moment it looked as though the two rats would fight each other, but in the end Smith calmed down and spun sullenly on his heel. Don't forget, Barker. Old Stumpy's going to speak to all of us, so you best be there if you value your head. The two rats leapt off the platform and ran into the tunnel laughing. Barker's tears dried up and his wailing deteriorated to a rasping whine. You'll stand put until you tell me what I want to know, said Piccadilly. The rat was horrified, 
and in a panic he screamed, No, 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 Bark, Bark, I must go. All, all must be there for the meat. He says, all, all have to go. They get their throats cut. And with a tremendous burst of strength, he burst free of the mouse's grasp and he leapt off the platform into the tunnel. Piccadilly spun round and he took hold of Marty's paw urgently. This is it, he exclaimed. This is our chance to discover what's going on. If we follow Barker to this meeting, we could find out who old Stump is and listen to his plans. Smith held a torch high above his head and he peered into the chamber. Everything was ready. A platform of bricks and boxes had been made in the centre for the speaker to address them. Torches had been placed all around and their brazen light licked over the grimy walls with lurid, dancing tongues. Everyone would be able to see their glorious leader. The chamber was a forgotten service passage, lined with thick, heavy-duty pipes and cables which ran from floor to ceiling. A ragged, foul-smelling cloth had been hung over the entrance, and Smith found himself clucking with anticipation. Soon, old Stumpy would divulge his plans. There came the sound of many feet dragging on the ground, accompanied by the sweep of strong, thick tails trailing behind. Smith yanked the curtain aside, and the entire rat population of the city poured in like a colossal flood of fur. Even Smith was amazed at the number of rats. There were young rats and old, strong ones, bony ones, and wizened, hatchet-faced old sinners who cursed and swore. Numerous shady characters shifted easily, on their guard in case of treachery. Nobody knew everyone there, and no one knew the purpose of the meeting. The atmosphere was tense but expectant. Eventually, every single one of the vile creatures had squeezed into the foul den. Some of them had climbed up the walls and perched themselves on the cables for a better view of the platform. There were several thousand evil, gleaming eyes in the chamber, and all of them reflected the flickering torchlight like a treasury of hellish jewels. The stench of all their filthy, sweating bodies was atrocious. Smith put his claws into his mouth, and he blew a loud whistle to tell Kelly to escort in their leader. A frantic pattering caught his attention, and he looked crossly down the passage, wondering who would dare to arrive so late. Here, you poxy slug! He bawled when he recognised Barker, puffing up to him. Where have you been? We told you not to be late, eh? We told you. And he dealt the old rat a cruel blow with his claws. Barker yelled and he ran through the curtain, cowering and yelping. Piccadilly and Marty had followed Barker at a safe distance, so that he had no idea they were following. They had pursued him down pitch-black passages and tunnels, splashed through ice-cold puddles of stinking water, and squelched through ghastly stretches of thick mud. They knew that they were deep in the heart of rat territory. Bad smells hung around like mists, and slithery slime dripped off walls and oozed over the ground. I think we're nearly there, whispered Piccadilly. There's a faint light up ahead. They were viewing the entrance to the meeting chamber at some distance. They heard Barker's rough treatment of the claws of Smith, and saw a brighter chink of light as the old rat dodged inside. What was that whistle? asked Marty. Piccadilly was not certain. Oh, it sounded like, it sounded like some kind of signal. We must find out what's going on in there. But we can't march right up and listen. Uh, there's someone on guard. Their discussion was brought to an end when they heard a sound that froze their blood. Heavy rat footsteps were coming up the tunnel behind them. Marty closed his eyes, waiting to be grabbed by rough claws. But Piccadilly caught hold of his paw and tugged him to one side. The rats drew closer, and the mice heard Kelly's voice speaking. Everyone should be in there now, boss. They're all dying to know what you've got to tell them. Marty scuttled fearfully along the wall, away from the approaching rats. He and Piccadilly were trapped, with no chance of escape. Suddenly the wall against his back seemed to crumble and fall away. 
Piccadilly wondered where his friend had gone. One minute he was at his side, the next he seemed to have vanished. Something yanked Piccadilly's tail, and he went sprawling backwards into a hole in the wall. Um, I, I think it's some sort of pipe, Marty breathed. Piccadilly ran his paws thoughtfully over the pipe. Here, I wonder where it goes, he said. I think I can see a light up there. He got to his knees, but it was a very narrow pipe, and he began to wriggle along. Finally, he made it to the end of the pipe, and his face was lit from underneath by a lurid torchlight. The meeting chamber was below him. He was looking out from high up in one of its walls, partially hidden from view by the thick cables which disappeared into the lofty ceiling. Piccadilly gazed down at the rat assembly in wonder and dread. He never dreamt that there could be so many rats in all London. What is it? asked Marty, catching up with him and craning his neck to peer over his shoulder. Oh, my! he exclaimed on seeing the chamber and its occupants. He felt his knees turn to water, and he looked fearfully at Piccadilly. Ah, oh, don't worry, said his friend. They won't see us up here. They'll all be too busy looking at old Stumpy. A commotion below made the mice look down again. The sea of rats near the curtain was parted as Smith led their leader in. Mike way, Mike way, he yelled, ploughing through the throng. Smith stepped onto the platform and wiped his running nose on his arm. Right, brother rats, he called out proudly. I has the uh, great honour to introduce to you our great leader. Uh, now do some of us legs as old Stumpy. It was a tremendous roar as the rats cheered and thumped their tails with approval. Old Stumpy came onto the stage, and high above, watching from the pipe, Piccadilly choked back a cry of shock. Old Stumpy was an ugly piebald rat. He had a ring through one ear, and something glittery hung round his neck. His tail was just a stump, hence the nickname. And Piccadilly recognised him at once. Morgan! He spat. Here was Jupiter's old lieutenant, that master of slyness whom everyone had presumed had perished when his foul master's tail had swept him into the sewer water. Piccadilly's face hardened. He remembered that it was Morgan who had given his friend Albert Brown to Jupiter. Do you know him? asked Marty in surprise. Oh, I once swore I'd kill him, said Piccadilly. Down on the platform, Morgan began his speech. Lads, he shouted, you'll be here because of blood. You have none. Where be the hot burning blood of the ravenous rat? It don't run in your veins. I should know. I comes from Deptford. The crowd murmured admiringly. Everyone had heard of the rats of Deptford and how vicious they were. When I come here, Morgan continued, I couldn't believe my eyes. I mean, there you were, you miserable vermin, fawning and scraping, afraid of mice and your own shudders. It made me honk. I was so disgusted. He pointed to Smith and Kelly and a few other fierce-looking brutes. See what can be done if you forget your lily-livered ways and follow me? Turn to the path of tooth and claw. Let blood flow in the underground. The crowd began to buzz. Some of the rats nodded eagerly and opened their slavering jaws. Morgan danced round the platform, whipping his audience into a frenzy. Why should I stay away from the puny mouse whores? I mean, what right have they got to the best pickings, hmm? Rats are strong. We are mighty. Our teeth bite and tear. We have claws to slash and split open. Now hear me, you rats. Have you never had the blood craze? Have your eyeballs never burned with hate for everything save yourselves? Have you never slaughtered and gorged on blood? The rats became possessed as Morgan's hate and hunger consumed them like a raging fire. They waved their claws in the air, slashing furiously like tigers. Those near the platform banged their fists on it, passionately. 
Morgan grinned. It was all going according to his plans. Now he would rule an army of rats. Just what he'd always wanted. His beady red eyes flicked over his followers and he nodded with satisfaction. Suddenly, a voice shouted from the far corner and all turned to see who it was. A scabby-faced black rat was trying to make himself heard above the din. Hang on! Hang on! he cried. What do you want to listen to him for? We're happy enough, ain't we? So what if the mouses call us names and have first claim to all the grub? I prefer the stuff they don't want. We ain't no killers. Oh, you should go back to Deptford where you belong instead of stirring up trouble here. The crowd looked at Morgan expectantly, but he merely smiled. Um, uh, come forward, friend, he said disarmingly, and come up here where I can see you proper. I should like to talk with you. The scabby rat pushed through the crowd and was lifted up next to Morgan. Um, tell me, said the piebald rat smarmily, um, what be it about me that offends you so? The rat shrugged. Oh, it ain't personal. It's just that I, I don't think we should go around murdering anything just for, just for the sake of it. I mean, why can't we just go on as we always have? Morgan whirled round and grabbed him by the scruff of the neck. This is what makes me sick, he cried to the audience. Cowardly, weakly scum. He be no rat. He don't deserve to live. He threw the astonished rodent down, leapt into the air and lunged at him. With one swift slash of his powerful claws, he tore out the other's throat. The assembly was in confusion, not knowing whether to be angry or afraid. That... That is what happens to the weak and the spineless, boon Morgan, kicking his victim off the platform. Follow me, and you shall drink sweeter blood. Mouse is better by far. A mouse's flesh is tender and juicy, and when fried, his ears are good enough to die for. The rats went wild. They tore the dead rat apart, and they tasted whatever they could get their claws on. We go to war, screamed Morgan triumphantly. Death to all mice! Death! 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 Echoed the assembly, licking their lips and feeling the hatred burning behind their eyeballs. Morgan had done his work well. Piccadilly and Marty held on to each other in shock. Marty was pale and he shook all over. Oh, what are we going to do? he wept. They're, they're going to eat us all. Yeah, well, we must warm them in a hole, born Marty, said Piccadilly. They began to ease back out of the narrow pipe, but in doing so, Marty dislodged some loose rubble. It fell into the chamber, and the torches spluttered. Every bloodthirsty rat looked upwards and saw Piccadilly's startled face. Mouse! they screamed at the top of their evil voices. Get him! commanded Morgan. He'll warn the others! The rats began to scramble up the wall towards the broken pipe. Piccadilly could hear their curses and their claws scrabbling against the bricks. Wildly, he turned to Marty. Ah, they haven't seen you yet. You've got to get out and warn everybody at Holborn. I'll keep them busy here. Marty gave his hero a hug. Oh, green savers, he prayed. Piccadilly pushed him away. Hurry up! Marty slithered down the pipe and was gone. Green save us indeed. Piccadilly shook his head. Oh, I don't believe in no green mouse. Trust in yourself, lad. That's how you managed before. I'll give those rats a run for their supper, I will. He took hold of his little knife and he stuck his head out of the pipe once more. The walls were smothered in heaving bodies, each trying to be the first to catch him. Oi! Down for brains? Piccadilly yelled to them. Here I am! What are you waiting for? On the platform, Morgan recognised the city mouse and his temper flared. Kill! 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 He stormed. Piccadilly hurled rocks down at the oncoming rats. He hit one right between its eyes, and it dropped to the ground stone dead. But there were too many of them, and Piccadilly was running out of missiles. When they were within range, he lashed out with his knife, Claws splintered and flew, but the mouse could not keep it up. His arm ached and 
he decided that it was time to leave. Here, yeah, Marty should be clear of the Ratlands by now, he thought. So with one final chop that lopped off a huge spotty ear, he darted down the pipe and into the tunnel. Where's he gone? wailed the rats in dismay. He's escaping down the tunnel, you fools! screamed Morgan impatiently. The curtain was torn down and the rat army trampled over it. There he is, they cried. Get him! Piccadilly raced down the tunnel as fast as he could. The stones cut his feet, but he didn't care. The rats were directly behind him, and that was all that mattered. He shot through the slimy passages and out into the underground, leaping over the track and not daring to look back. The harsh cries of the rats rang in his ears. He saw an arch of light ahead. He was coming to a station. He could lose them there if only he could make it. And with his heart pounding desperately, he raced nearer. And then he made his mistake. He glanced over his shoulder. A sharp stab of pain seared through his foot as it struck the rail and twisted awkwardly. Piccadilly howled. He lost his balance and he fell headlong onto one of the concrete sleepers. His head struck the corner with a mighty crack and he rolled, unconscious beneath the track. A suffocating blackness engulfed him and he knew no more. Thomas Triton in his bunk aboard the Cutty Sark stirred in his sleep. Tap. The midshipmast rolled over, half waking. Tap. He sat up crossly. What in thunderation's going on? He fumed. Can't a mouse get any kip? He threw off the bedclothes and climbed out onto the deck. Tap. Thomas stared over the side of the ship and peered at the concrete floor below. There, cowering in the shadows, was a timid squirrel, meekly throwing stones against the ship. What in Davy Jones are you doing there, lad? barked Thomas. The squirrel squealed in surprise, and with a flash of his tail disappeared behind a railing and into some bushes. The midshipmouse sighed and drummed his fingers impatiently. Squirrels were always jittery. He wondered why one should have come from the park to get him out of bed. A frightened face appeared through the leaves. Uh, uh, Mr. Triton? It ventured in a low whimper. But is that you? Thomas muttered under his breath. Ah, of course it's me, you stupid Nelly. But he called out. Ah, it's Triton. Come out of them bushes. You're in no danger here. The squirrel stole into the light and crept over the concrete. He looked up at the towering black shape of the Katisark and fluttered his paws. Shaking fearfully all over, he said, uh, You must come. Uh, uh, she, she wants some uh, we. Oh, oh dear, this is another. Oh, it's so dreadful. Oh, oh, oh. Thomas ground his teeth. Last thing he wanted to deal with was a sniveling squirrel. Just tell me what the matter is, he called down. The squirrel wrung his paws together. What the matter? Oh, dear me, it's all so ghastly and hideous, with them dead and me here. Oh, why me? Thomas slapped the deck loudly. For the last time, lad, tell me squirrely what has happened, or I'm off to bed again. The squirrel cleared his throat and cried, Murder! There's been, there's been murder in the park. I've been sent to fetch you, Mr. Triton. She wants to talk with you. Stay right there. I'll be down in a trice, said Thomas, and he ran down to the hold. Murder? He wondered who'd been killed and by whom. He did not need to ask who she was. Thomas knew that. Only the star wife could have forced one of her subjects out when he was in such a state. He emerged into the outside world and climbed down the ship's rudder. Once on the ground... He climbed the steps out of the large trough which enclosed the ship and ran over to the squirrel. Tell me, he asked, what's all this about murder and well, why does the star wife want to see me, eh? The squirrel scudded under the bush but did not come from behind the railings. No time, no time, he chirruped excitedly. Follow me, and he scampered away along a hedge. Thomas did not like this. He wanted answers. He saw the squirrel dart and dodge in and out of cover all along the road that led to the park. With a resigned shake of his head, he set off after him. 
Squirrel nipped under parked cars, threaded its way through rails, slipped beneath buzzing sodium street lamps, and bounded under the locked park gates. Thomas puffed up behind. He ducked under the iron gateway, and the squirrel's voice called out from the lofty safety of a tree, Mother, hurry up! Mother, hurry up! The midship mouse saw a small, long-tailed shape flit from branch to branch overhead. He looked over to the observatory hill and breathed in deeply. There was chaos up there, and he could hear faint voices cry. The hill was a wreck. Trees had been smashed down and great fissures made in the earth. Anxiously, he wondered how it could have happened. Squirrels were running everywhere, oblivious to the astonished midship mouse climbing the steep hill path. Uprooted rhododendron bushes were scattered over the grassy slopes, and clods of earth littered the pathway. But over all was a glittering layer of frost. The night was filled with frantic cries and voices raised in misery. Thomas passed a group of squirrels huddled together, weeping. At their feet lay the body of one of their comrades. He'd been impaled by a slender spear made of ice. The body was frozen solid, and it was white with frost. As Thomas removed his hat, he noticed other groups racked with sorrow. In all, twenty-three young squirrels had been killed with ice spears wedged between their ribs. The sad little bodies littered the frosted grass. Thomas moved slowly through the crowds of bitter grief, his face pale and bewildered. A triton? came a cracked voice. He looked up from the devastation, and there was the star wife leaning on her stick. The age-old mistress of the squirrel colony appeared more tired and careworn than Thomas had ever known her. Ma'am, he said in a distressed tone, what has happened here? The star wife turned her half-blind, milky eyes from the ruin around her and said hollowly, We have been attacked. She was dejected and frail, and Thomas's heart went out to her. This once proud and imperious squirrel, who had terrified many, including himself, was now shrunk to a shambling, pathetic creature whose grief and care was too much to bear. She prodded the frozen ground with her stick and shuddered with the cold. Mr. Triton, she asked softly, would you take me away from, from this? Help me to my chambers, please? He took her arm and led her through the destruction. A hollow oak lay splintered and broken on the frost-covered grass and under the tangled mass of its upturned roots a great hole was revealed. This had been the entrance to the squirrels' underground dwellings, where they stored all their winter food and their volumes of history, lore, and astrological formula. Thomas helped the star wife down the entrance. Along the tunnels they went, and the star wife began telling Thomas of the night's terrible events. I was not easy, she began. The evening was drawing on, and a disquiet had settled heavily on my heart. There was something very wrong, and I was in a foul temper because I, I did not know what it was. She put her gnarled paw to her head and made a gesture signifying stupidity. All of a sudden, the temperature dropped, and... A, a freezing cold flooded through the tunnels. I, I did not know where it came from. It was not a natural thing. I made my way to a lookout hatch and peered out into the night. Even my feeble eyes could not mistake what I saw. There was a great dark cloud in the sky, shot through with purple lightnings flying directly overhead. And suddenly a, a fog appeared, a thick fog which began to seep in. I heard some of my sentries cry out, and, and then there came a deafening, rending and crashing. I don't mind telling you, Triton, I, I was very afraid, and still am. My stomach turned over with fright as I 
as I realized. Well, here we are. They'd come to a tapestry banner hung across the tunnel. It was the entrance to her chamber. The star wife motioned to Thomas to pass through. With some trepidation, the midship mouse did as he was bid, and the star wife waited for a moment before she followed him. The room of the star wife was smashed to pieces. The carved oaken throne was split in two, and the roof had been torn off. Everything was covered in deep frost and ice, more so than anywhere else. Thomas's feet sank deep into the biting whiteness, and he uttered little gasps as he felt them painfully tingle and turn almost blue. He gazed fearfully about the destroyed chamber. Rubble from the roof had fallen in and filled the corners, and the shiny objects which had once dangled like the constellations were strewn about in heaps. He could hardly believe it was the same place. The violent destruction had been wanton, wrecking, just for the sake of it. Thomas groaned in disbelief. Ah, well, I'm, I'm mighty sorry, ma'am, he said awkwardly. I, I don't know what I can do for you, but if I can help in any way, then... Sorry? she exclaimed with some of her old fire. Sorry, Triton? You were not brought here to feel sorry for me and my folk. Look about you, you stupid seafarer. Can't you see? Thomas was taken aback. He glanced round. Yes, there did seem to be something missing from the chamber. But he could not put his finger on what it could be. The star wife slammed her stick down in agitation. My star glass, you fool, she cried. My stardust has been stolen. The ancient power of the star wives, the star glass, was not to be found anywhere. But Thomas knew that this was a great calamity. For the star glass possessed tremendous magical forces. The star wife's shoulders drooped, and she became tired once more. I... Uh... I did not finish my tale, she said quietly, so let me do so now. With her stick she scraped the frost from the cracked seat of her throne and lowered herself down. I realized that whatever was hiding in the mist had broken into my chamber. And then I heard a, a deep rumbling like a Oh, a contented purr booming through the fog. Oh, the mist began to rise, and as it did so, I saw something that stopped my heart beating. For there, in, in the dense mist of the fog, I saw the outline of a huge cat. It was as, as tall as a tree, and through its vast shape, I could see the stars. Why, I don't understand, stammered the midship mouse. You mean it, it was transparent? Yes, yes, it, it was not a thing of flesh and blood. She gripped her stick tightly until her crippled, swollen knuckles turned white. And I believe, she said in a quaking voice, that it was the spirit of Jupiter. Green, save us. Let us hope that he can, Triton. Let us hope that he can. For if Jupiter has indeed escaped the bonds of death and entered the living world once more, his power is beyond measure. And now he has your star glass. She hung her head. Just so, she admitted sadly. What he will do with it cannot be certain. He is now an, an unbeast, an, an unquiet spirit, not governed by the rules of the living. His presence in our world has thrown into confusion more the old prophecies. He has so changed the natural order of things that I, I do not know and cannot foresee uh, uh, what he may do. The wintry place fell into silence 
as Thomas digested what she had told him. If Jupiter had indeed returned, then he would no doubt seek out those who were responsible for his downfall. The midship mouse thought of the Brown family and everyone else in the skirtings with a, a worried expression on his face. He clapped his paws together in a vain attempt to warm them and said, Ma'am, I must go and warn my friends, or they should be told. Oh, if indeed that foul devil has risen from the dead, he'll want revenge. The star wife did not appear to have heard it. A wrinkled chin was resting on the smooth, worn handle of her walking stick. Thomas touched her gingerly on the shoulder. I heard you, Triton, she said gruffly. I agree. The girl Audrey needs to be told. You are going to take me to the skirtings. Thomas spluttered in protest. But, but, uh, whatever for? Uh, I have business there, she snapped. You need to warn the Brown family, and as I cannot see what will happen in the days to come, I must see the bats and ask their advice. Thomas groaned. And that is the end of side one. The morning was chill and dismal. A ghostly frost touched everything, and the branches of the trees seemed to shiver miserably. The sun was hidden by thick blanketing clouds, and the light which fell on the land was dull and lifeless. Audrey was finishing her breakfast when a confused babbling reached her ears. It came from the hall, and many voices were raised in curious exclamations. She ran out of the kitchen and climbed the step into the hall. There the discussion had broken up, and all the mice were gathered round the cellar door. Few in the skirtings ever ventured near the cellar. The grill was down there, and beyond there were the sewers, which had once been Jupiter's terrifying realm. A hearty voice boomed from behind the cellar door. Right, budge up, mates. Make room for us there, was Thomas Triton. Audrey sighed thankfully, but her relief turned to surprise when a different voice added sternly, Out of my way, you stupid mice! She touched her paws and stepped back in fear. She knew who that was, and she hated her. Thomas edged past the cellar door and led the old squirrel after him. She blinked in the light of the hall and peered round at the expectant, curious faces trained on her. What are you staring at? she added haughtily. Haven't you ever seen a squirrel before? Actually, the mice hadn't, and they all wanted a good look. They elbowed each other out for a better view, and stared quite rudely with their mouths open. The star wife slammed her stick down. Have you nothing better to do, idiots? she cried. Out of my way there! And she swung her stick before her. The mice fell back in surprise and cleared a path. Just then, Master Old Nose came forward to welcome her. Greetings, he said, beaming from ear to ear. What an honor! to have the great star wife herself in our midst. She squinted at him and sniffed. You must be old nose, as I've heard about you. He bowed, greatly flattered, and smiled even wider, until she added, You are a daft, pompous old nibbler, whose opinion of himself is greater than his brain. The star wife left him opening and closing his mouth like a goldfish, and walked over to Audrey, whom she had just noticed slowly backing away and heading for home. Stay there, girl, the old squirrel snapped. Now don't pout. It spoils your looks. She stood in front of Audrey and tapped her stick thoughtfully. I've heard about Fenny Wold, she said. You must tell me what happened in detail later. Audrey nodded respectfully, but the star wife had turned away and was looking for Thomas. Where's that old fool of a sailor got to? she grumbled. The midship mouse had slipped in to see Audrey's mother, and the two of them now came out of the Browns' home. Gwen looked at the squirrels steadily, and she'd not forgiven her for sending Audrey away. Hello, she said politely, but without her usual warmth. Can we do anything for you? Don't worry, the star wife reassured her. I'm not going to steal your daughter, but you can help me. Could I have a seat, please? 
Well, I think my legs will give way if I don't sit down soon. Gwen Brown called for Arthur to bring out a stool. And when he brought it, the star wife thanked him and eased herself down. She surveyed the mice and pounded the floor with her stick. A hush fell. Mice of Deptford, the squirrel began. I bring grave news. I believe that your greatest enemy has returned from the other side. In the life, he was called Jupiter. Now, now he is a phantom, an unbeast, more powerful than anything this troubled world has ever known. You cannot imagine the forces this abomination controls now that he has the star glass. Audrey gasped, and the rest of the mice sensed the urgency and fear in the squirrel's voice. Oh, what are we to do? wailed Biddy Cockle hysterically. I don't know, the star wife replied. Without my star glass, I cannot see how we may rid the world of this black fiend. How does one destroy that which has already been destroyed? Jupiter is dead, yet he still torments us. That is the problem. We cannot kill what is no longer alive. And then, but then we are lost, stammered Master Old Nose. It is hopeless. The star wife raised her stick to quell the rising panic. Perhaps not, she said. My powers are gone, and yet I am not the only one so gifted. Others have the ability to see into the future and know the secrets it jealously guards. You, uh, you mean the bats? asked Arthur suddenly. I do indeed, she announced. I have come from Greenwich to have an audience with the bats who live in the attic here. They will be able to tell me all I need to know, and together we may come up with a solution. She paused. Everyone was groaning with despair. The star wife pounded her stick impatiently. What is wrong? she demanded. Uh, the bats have gone, Gwen replied. They all abandoned us two nights ago. I do not think there's a single one left in Deptford. The star wife stared at her as though she were mad. Then we are lost, she murmured. Without their aid, all, all shall perish. Her last hope was crushed, and she bowed her head in defeat. The grim evening closed round the old house and sealed it in darkness. Deptford was tightly locked in the bleakest night it had ever known. The rooftops glistened with frosty ground glass, whilst icicles spiked and skewered down from the gutters, looking like the eyebrows of some stern, ancient creature. Not a soul stirred outside. Doors were bolted and curtained windows tried to shut out the wailing wind. In the skirtings, nobody could remember the weather ever being so severe. Families were putting their bedding round the great fire in the hall and settling the younger ones down, hoping they could get some much-needed sleep. At the edge of the circle of orange firelight sat the star wife. She was deep in thought, lost in lonely memories, dredging up all the forgotten rhymes and words of lore that she'd ever learned. A child cried and shattered the crackling, chattering calm, and the hall sank into shuddering cold. Not even the fire could thaw. The night seemed to creep and claw closer, suffocating any talk and oppressing everyone. The dismayed mice raised their worried faces in the pale flame glow. Something unnatural was happening. A bitter wind wailed outside and blasted through the keyhole. The fire spluttered smokily, and all eyes smarted. The grim grave dark pushed down, and, and the flames gave one last cough and went out. Oh, what's happening? whimpered Mrs. Cockle in panic. Light the fire again, please! But the fire refused to be lit. 
It was as if the cold had seeped into the wood and frozen it beyond the reach of flames. Thomas struck frantically at his tinderbox, but nothing would catch. It's no good, Triton, came the croaky voice from the darkness. The midship mouse paused and glanced around, and there, staggering into the light, was the star wife. She hobbled forward, leaning heavily on her stick and gritting her teeth against the grinding pain of her set bones. This is not a natural cold, she said, trembling, and well you know it. To put your box away, we, we might need it later. It will not help now. The squirrel faced all the frightened mice and raised her stick. Now listen to me, mice of Deptford, she called urgently. Jupiter is abroad. It is he who spreads the evil winter. His is the dark will behind all of this. The mice mumbled and whispered. Is there a way we can get out of this place without climbing to the roof or, or going through the sewers? She asked. I must know Jupiter's strength. Well, there's the yard, piped up Arthur from the gloom. Good, snapped the squirrel. Let us go there. Some of the mice decided to stay where they were, but others wrapped their blankets round themselves and trailed obediently into the kitchen where, under orders, Master Old Nose began pulling out the crunched-up papers which had been stuffed into the hole that led to the outside. In the yard it was unbelievably cold. The concrete ground glistened and the branches of the hawthorns were bleached to a deathly white. The old squirrel glanced around like a dog, hunting for a scent. She held her stick out before her and tapped the tinkling grass. She grunted and ran her aching fingers over the rasping, frosted wall. Yes, it is as I feared, she told Thomas darkly. This is as it was in my chamber. The enemy swells in strength and puts forth his infernal powers. There cannot be any doubt. But tonight he will use my star glass. The star wife hissed through her teeth, shook her fist at the darkness, and struck the fence with a walking stick in her frustration. I must know what is happening. Uh, can anyone climb the fence? I, I can do it, volunteered Arthur suddenly. He pushed forward, rushing and slipping over the ice. He'd learnt the skill of nimbly scampering up stalks in Fennyworld, and a fence post wasn't that different. Excellent child! said the squirrel. Oh, you go and tell us what you see. Arthur stood below one of the posts and blew on his chilled paws before gripping it. He clutched the post and he pulled himself up. The frost stabbed and seared his shrinking palms and he had to close his eyes tightly, blocking the pain from his mind, ignoring the agony, focusing all his energies on his goal. He had to reach the top. Below, the mice huddled together to keep warm as they watched his slow ascent. The tubby mouse's nails ripped and split as he clawed his way to the top, feeling nothing but the ice cutting into him and the freezing air slicing up his steaming nose. And then he was there. The harsh, bullying wind plucked and flattened his ears as he struggled to balance on the topmost rail of the rickety old fence. What do you see? The star wife's voice floated up to him. Arthur surveyed the land before him over the next door's garden and beyond the empty street. The flats opposite reared into the starlit sky but were partially hidden by the patches of pale mist which flowed slowly across the blind windows and groped hungrily at the latches. Arthur shivered, and in the corner of his eye something glimmered. He twisted round sharply. Past the church there was the black shape of the power station, squat and solid. He rose out of a sea of thick, billowing fog, and it sparked. With a shock he realized that that was where Jupiter had made his base. Well, the star wife's frail voice asked. He looked down, and he saw the pinched, chilled faces of his family and friends that were all turned to him. He's in the power station, he called down. That's where... But he did not finish what he'd started to say, for at that moment a terrific rumble shook the ground and the fence swayed alarmingly. Arthur held on grimly, 
but he did not move, for even as he raised his eyes back to the old disused building, a great plume of smoke belched out of the power station's chimney. It rose steadily into the night sky and hung there, gradually swelling into a vast, dense cloud through which bolts of fierce lightning spat jaggedly. Deafening thunder cracked the heavens, and in the midst of the great cloud, Arthur could plainly see the faint, shimmering outline of an enormous, demonic cat. The thunder boomed through the echoing night, but amid its roar, Arthur clearly heard a high, triumphant, screeching laugh. Arthur half slid, half fell down the fence post. Frozen splinters cut into his paws and feet like cruel little daggers, but he paid them no attention. He landed on the ground with a bump and a thud. His bottom sizzled with the cold as he sat on the icy concrete, gazing stupidly up at the astonished crowd of mice who gathered round him. Arthur, dear, cried his mother, whatever's the matter? And she rushed forward, but the star wife stick flashed out and prevented her from reaching him. He has seen the unbeast, said the squirrel. The world was lit suddenly by a brilliant flash of lightning. Thunder rolled and the earth trembled. The flickering outline of the Lord of the Winter rose above them and the mice covered their faces in fear. The unquiet spirit of Jupiter was immense. A cat of nightmare proportions. From his mouth, his deadly breath hailed down, full of winter's hatred for the living. His snarls were like thunder and his anger a blizzard. Hear me, servants of the dark void, his voice hissed upwards. I am the lord of the world, whilst you cringe, trapped forever in your exile. Know that I, Jupiter, have unlocked the gates of death, and trouble once more the unhappy land. I call you to witness, witness now the tumult that I bring. He raised his mighty arms above his head, and he laughed wildly. Between his cruel claws, something small shimmered with a silver light. That's the star glass, breathed Thomas fearfully. In Jupiter's huge, brutish claws, the star glass of the star wife looked like a tiny toy. Slave of the timeless stars, he bellowed. Obey your new master. And he called out a sentence of harsh, powerful words from the far reaches of the abyss. Ramil, say no more, mas, I sagol call. In his claws, the star glass began to pulse with light as it spilled out its power. The magic of centuries, stored in the depths, poured forth, and a high-pitched scream issued from its heart. No! gloated Jupiter coldly. You must obey me. I know your secret name, and have uttered the charm laid down long ago. The celestial pivots are loosened, and I command you to hold the heavens once more. The silver light from the star glass suddenly soared upwards. The unbeast yelled in his triumph and began to dance like a maniac. Thomas felt Jupiter's shrieks of joy boom round his head, and he cried out in pain. It hurt so much that he started to hallucinate. It seemed as if the very stars swirled and boiled. But he was not imagining it. The stars were indeed exploding and seething. A host of wailing voices filled the air as one by one they were extinguished. Their light streamed to the earth, slivers of brilliant thread shooting out of the black chasm. The slender beams were sucked down to where Jupiter was flourishing the star glass, down into its depths where the brilliance was impossible to look on. The constellations were quenched, snuffed out, by the tremendous powers of both Jupiter and the age-old star glass. The endless eternal void came flooding in, and the world was plunged into darkness. Not one single star was left in the pitch-black sky. All their precious, angry light 
was trapped in the glass, and Jupiter was its master. Piccadilly stirred and groaned in agony. The darkness was damp, and his face was pressed against the grit floor that cut into his bruised cheek. He tried to focus his eyes and, and take in where he was. It seemed to be a shallow pit beneath one of the tube rails. Ooh, ooh, he grunted, putting a fragile paw to his forehead. He winced and screwed up his face as he felt a lump the size of an egg. He decided to try and stand. Oh, right. Gently does it, he told himself. His pounding head made him sway unsteadily and his legs felt like jelly. Resting against the side of the pit, he tried to remember what had happened to him. He'd been running, tripped, hit his head and fallen down, and suddenly he remembered. He remembered who he'd been running from. The rats, he cried, and glanced fearfully down the dark tunnel, but it was empty and quiet as the grave. Well, they can't have seen me trip, he concluded gratefully. The twerps must have run right over me without realising. The smile that had formed on his lips froze, and he sucked in the air sharply. Holborn, he exclaimed, panic-stricken. What has happened? Did the, did the rats attack? He hoped Marty had got back in time to warn everyone. He hauled himself out of the pit, and he made for the station ahead. How still everything was. No foraging parties or, or lookout scouts anywhere. He hastily made for the main entrance to Holborn, his mind racing and his heart missing every other beat. A noise round a blind corner brought him to an abrupt halt. There came a sound of shambling footsteps. It was unmistakably a rat. A cold gleam flashed off his little knife as he drew it slowly from his belt and readied himself. Oh, it ain't right. Um, let's run what we can leave them to it. Um, um, we don't want none of it, do we? I mean, no, 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 no more lumps on me edge. Piccadilly relaxed and lowered his knife. It was only Barker. The mouse waited for the balmy creature to turn the corner, and before he knew what was happening, Piccadilly had grabbed and pinned him against the wall. Oh, yeah! ah! <laughs> Screamed the rat in surprise. Piccadilly put his paw over his mouth. Shh! He hissed. If I hear you so much as breathe, I'll give you so many lumps you won't be able to count them. There. Now it's better. We don't want your mates coming to see what all the fuss is about, now do we? Now then, what happened? Where is everyone? Did they get away or what? Barker stared at him, with a mad, terrified look in his eyes, and wildly shook his head. Oh, no, it, it weren't Barker, he denied quickly. He, he had nothing to do with it. He, he, he wouldn't touch mousy meat, Barker wouldn't. Piccadilly stood back and choked. Oh, old Stumpy urged the son, and we, we, we charged into him, you see, continued Barker. But the lads were, were mad with the blood craving, and them, their mouses hadn't a clue what was happening. And they, 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 was, they was took totally by surprise. It was sickening, seeing how easy they was cut down, and like, like, like straws, like straws they fell. At this point, Barker covered his ears and a large tear fell from his snout. I, I can still hear them, he wept. They were, they were squeaking and, and, and crying out for help. Piccadilly felt cold. A dull wave of shock washed over him and his stomach lurched inside. Are they, are they all dead? he asked thickly. The rat raised his head. Oh, the ground was, 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 was scarlet. Oh, oh, stump him made all of us check out all the halls and the tiny rooms and, and there, were all, there were awful yells as families was dragged out and taken away, taken away to, to, to be peeled. Now old Stumpy's calling himself King, King of the City. Kelly chuckled to Smith as he draped a mouse skin over his shoulders and twirled around. Ain't I lovely, he 
said, dribbling all down his front. The bell of the ball, that's me. And he swished down the hall, dragging the forlorn skin behind him. Smith hooted and threw another crispy mouse ear into his jaws. What a fight it had been. Never could he remember having such a marvellous time. And the feast! Mouse ears and juicy mouse meat, succulent and tender. He'd never tasted such things before, but oh, they seemed to stir some ancient dormant spirit in him. And he lusted for more. Even though he was stuffed, he, he still had the craving. Morgan sat on the Thane's throne and sniggered to himself. What a day this had been. This was what he'd always longed for, to lead and be in control of a vast army. If only some of his old lads could see him now. Oh, for a moment he thought back to his former days in Deptford. Oh, he was well out of that. He could still not understand how Jupiter had duped him all those years, pretending to be a rat god when all the time he was just some mangy old cat getting fat from his labours. Shears, shears, stump, stumpy saluted a gorged rat, waddling past the dace with a bowl of blood in his claws. Morgan returned the greeting and bent his piebald head to drink from his own bowl. The slurp died in his throat as he stared down into the brimming bowl. His chisel-shaped snout was reflected in the swirling thick liquid, but only for a moment. Something strange began to happen. The blood became cloudy and ice spiked in from the edge into the centre until it was frozen solid. Morgan gasped, but he could not tear his eyes away. Somewhere, deep in the heart of the blood-red ice, two points of frosty light appeared. Morgan, called a distant, familiar voice. The colour drained out of the rat's face as he recognised the speaker. It, 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 cannot, it cannot be. It cannot be, he stammered. You, you are gone. You, you, drowned deep. Morgan, repeated the voice in a whisper. And the eyes in the ice seemed to look into his very soul. Mm, my lord, the hackles rose on Morgan's back and chill crept under his flesh. Is, is, is that you? Verily, it is I, Jupiter, your lord and master. I have come to claim my lieutenant. I need my old trusted friend by my side once more. Morgan's will was slowly ebbing away. Every second he looked into those eyes and heard that dreadful voice, the less he was able to wrench himself free. No, no, he struggled to say through the spells that were being wrapped round him. I, I, I won't, I won't never work for no, no damn Moggy. No, 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 not, not no more. I, I've got my own life. I've got my own life now, and then, and there's, there's no way. No way I'll come back, and, and not if you, if you be a hob yourself. But it was not easy to escape from Jupiter. Gradually the icy whispers needled their way into Morgan's heart. I need you, Morgan. Come back into my service. I see you have fashioned an army for yourself. Excellent. Bring them to me. Let them be my beloved subjects, and worship my beautiful cold. The genius of the Black Winter wishes to be adored as his body once was. Anything, anything you desire, Majesty, Morgan answered with his old subservience. Jupiter laughed softly and Morgan was enchanted by the cruel sound. Are you all right, boss? asked Smith, other side of the throne. Uh, you, uh, you look a bit peaky-like. Morgan looked up sharply. He saw Smith as though he was looking through a black veil that twisted and distorted everything. 
No, 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 nothing wrong with me, lad, he replied mechanically. Get your things together and tell the rest of the boys that we've, we've got to move on. What are you talking about, boss? cried Smith in astonishment. We don't have to shift from here yet. There's plenty of nose left. And it's not as if there's out to be afraid of. I mean, we're on a cushy number here. I mean, why don't we stay? Morgan's claws flashed out, and Smith's right ear was torn in two. Smith clapped hold of his head, and he jumped back in alarm. Obey me, snapped Morgan viciously, and he rose from the throne to address the astonished onlookers. Prepare to depart, he told them. We leave within the hour. Smith walked away from the throne, greatly troubled. His ripped ear throbbed and the blood trickled between his claws. Something was wrong, and he did not like it. Old Stumpy did not seem the same. Most faithful servant, said Jupiter. Bring your rabble to me at Deptford. I have a use for them. Morgan bowed. The eyes disappeared, and the ice melted in the bowl. And then he turned to his waiting lads. What are you hanging about for? He barked. Get your kit together. We go to Deptford. Deptford? They repeated with dismay. Oh, what are we going there for? Nearly everyone in the city had heard of that place, and the horror which once ruled the sewers there. All knew the rumours of the dreadful Jupiter, and nobody wanted to go anywhere near Deptford. No, no, I ain't going, some grumbled defiantly. Morgan snarled and shook his fists at them. Ain't going? he bellowed savagely. How oh, dang you! Haven't I led you all right so far? Haven't I let you taste mouse flesh? The rats mumbled with shameful faces. Yeah, but, but, but Deptford, implored one. I mean, why there? Because it is the fairest of lands, replied Morgan with a yearning in his voice. There the pickings are richer than anywhere else. The mouses are plump and just ripe, or just ripe for peeling. Acres of tender squeakers with none to harvest them. Oh, what a waste. Morgan was winning them over. The greed was still fresh in their hearts and they would do anything to get their claws on more mice. Let's hurry, he cried impatiently. Vinny, raise our standard. We go to war. Deptford shall be ours. The rat's lust for more blood swept away any doubts. To Deptford, 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 they cried throwing their mouse-skin hats into the air. In the gloom of the tube tunnel, Piccadilly rocked on his heels, cradling his face in folded arms while the heavy fringe of dark hair hid his downcast eyes. Perhaps he was cursed. That might account for all the misfortunes that occurred in his life. His parents had been killed when he was very young. He'd lost himself and ended up in the Deptford sewers where his new friend Albert Brown perished. And the only girl he'd ever liked had not cared for him. And now this. Barker had remained with the city mouse. He looked troubled, and he twitched his ears cautiously. The rat was frightened. It was dangerous to stay so near to Holborn. At any moment the marauders might spill out and pounce on them. There came a splintering creak as the great door was pulled open and horrible laughter issued into the tunnels. Piccadilly heard the heavy tramp of their trudging feet come closer and the rustling slither of their blood-soaked slimy bodies. He looked at Barker desperately. This time there was nowhere for him to hide. There were no holes here and the rats were too close for him to start running. Barker looked blankly back at him, pouting miserably. If they found him with a live mouse, they would kill him too. There was no escape for them. Piccadilly whipped out his little knife, and he ground his teeth together, waiting for the first of the bloodthirsty monsters. Suddenly, 
a claw flashed out and slammed him against the wall. Quiet, mousy boy, instructed Barker quickly. Stay in the shadow. The old rat had grabbed Piccadilly, pushing him down as small as he would go, and then stood in front of him, trying to obscure as much of the mouse as he could. Piccadilly drew his tail in and flattened his ears. This was a crazy idea, and only Barker could have thought of it. Any second, hundreds of rats were going to flood by, and one of them would surely spot him. He felt like pushing Barker aside and charging them anyway, but as he struggled to stand, the balmy old rat sat down on his back, and he couldn't budge. The army trooped in, their eyes fiery and filled with murderous lust. First came the newly appointed standard bearer, Vinny, a short, squat, pygmy of a rat, whose face was as wicked as sin and whose teeth were stained crimson. He carried the dreadful standard banner proudly before him and cackled at the top of his shrill voice. Barker looked up and shivered when he realized what the army's standard was. The evil creatures swarmed by with great leering faces. Some still wore their grisly trophies on their ugly, slobbering heads, and others chewed the remains of their feast. Here, Barker! shouted one. What you doing there? Ain't you any grub yet? Barker coughed and shook his head. Uh, well, I, I were waiting here for you lot to finish before I started tucking in, he answered with feigned heartiness. <laughs> I can't wait to munch real mouses. <laughs> ah, you daft old goat, they all hooted. Only Barker would be mad enough to miss out. Hey, what a loony! They were all so busy making fun of the old rat that none of them bothered to peer into the shadows and see what he was sitting on. Well, hurry up then, they told him. We're not stopping round here. And when they'd all passed out of earshot, Barker breathed a sigh of relief and released Piccadilly. Oh, thanks, said the mouse, stretching himself. Oh, that was a close one. Oh, I never want to be in such a tight spot again. But the rat was watching the army recede into the distance, and he seemed not to hear. Piccadilly rubbed life into his cramped legs, and then folded his arms and frowned. You know, I wonder where they're going, he said curiously. That's not the way back to their holes. Oh, didn't, didn't you hear, said Barker. Oh, old Stumpy is taking all the lads to Delpford, he says. There, there's lots of fat mouse down there. A cold fear blistered down Piccadilly's spine. He stared at Barker and he spoke quickly. We've got to stop them. We've got to stop them, Barker. My friend's there. The breeze was bitter. It nipped and pinched its way over the slate-grey River Thames and carried in its sharp, invisible fingers light flurries of snow. The steep river walls were riddled with small holes. Behind the green, moss-covered stones, dark, dripping passages led off under the city. It was through one of these secret ways that Morgan led his army. He popped his piebald head out of a livid patch of damp moss and squinted in the dull light of the dismal daybreak. He looked down, and he gauged the distance to the dark mud below. With a yell of determination, he jumped and landed with a squelch. Come on, boys, he called up. The rats rained out of the hole like water from an overflow pipe. They spattered in the soft, sucking sludge and covered each other from head to toe with it. Some happily slung the slop of one another, enjoying messing about in the filthy muck. Calm down, calm down, ordered Morgan. This is the quickest way, Sir Deptford, so you'll have to swim. The rats grumbled, but he glared at them, and he hobbled over to a large piece of driftwood, which he examined and carried to the water's scummy edge. He lowered it in and grunted satisfactorily. He, at least, would not have to get wet. He leapt onto his makeshift raft. War and bloodshed, he cried. Follow me to Deptford, fine soldiers. And then the current gripped the driftwood, and Morgan began to sail down river. The rats on the shore wasted no time. They yahooed and dived into the glacial water, shrieking and gasping in the ice-cold waves. But rats are very strong swimmers, and these were no exception. Their tails thrashed and whisked in the river, 
churning and convulsing the surface like a storm at sea. And with Morgan sailing before them, the rats began the long swim to Deptford. Five minutes later, Piccadilly came slithering and sliding out of the hole in the stone wall and fell wriggling down. Splat! He ploughed into the mire. Brush! Barker was buried head first. He kicked and jerked his legs while his knobbly tail whipped about and sent up vast sprays of mud. Hang on, said Piccadilly. He grabbed hold of the rat's feet and he yanked him out. Barker glistened with thick, wet slime and his startled round eyes peeped out of the muck. Piccadilly trudged to the river's edge and the ghastly mud squidged coldly between his toes and the brown water welled in. The city mouse shivered at its icy touch. He realised... He would not be able to swim in that. What he needed was a boat or something similar, so he started to look around the shore. Oh, wh wh what's Mousy Boy looking for? inquired Barker, wiping the slime from his face. Ah, oh, something that will float, Piccadilly replied. Here, lend us a paw, will you? The two of them hunted about in the rubbish, turning over bottles and tins and throwing them into the water to see if they floated. Piccadilly finally found the perfect thing, a red plastic pudding bowl big enough for two. He began to look for something he could use as paddles, and he came up with a broken wooden spoon and a large, strong gull's feather. He dragged his finds down towards the river's edge. Help me, he called to Barker. I've got to get after Morgan, and you're coming with me. Barker began to protest, but Piccadilly marched right up to him, grabbed him by the scruff of the neck, and made him climb into their new little boat. Barker whimpered as he clambered in. Piccadilly pushed and heaved the bowl and the rat into the water. It lurched and nearly turned over, and Barker wailed out loud. Piccadilly splashed after and hauled himself inside. Now, he said, once the rocking and the tilting had eased down. Right, take this, and he handed Barker the large feather while he took up the wooden spoon. Barker gazed at the feather stupidly, not sure what to do with it. Grinding his teeth in exasperation, Piccadilly showed him how to place it in the water and draw it back. After several minutes of frustrating coaching, they began to paddle. The little red bowl with its two unlikely mariners set off down the Thames as the snow began to fall, thick and heavy. The rats had swum fast and hard, and the river grew ever colder as they drew close to Deptford. As they neared the power station, they had to fight against drifting blocks of ice which bobbed stubbornly in their way. Morgan chortled as he kicked the obstructions out of his path. With a clonk, the raft hit the edge of the ice floe and juddered to a halt. Licking his lips, Morgan stepped nervously from the plank and flopped onto his belly. Oh, he snarled, spitting out a contemptuous green glob. Cautiously, the sour-faced rat wobbled to his feet and slid warily along the ice. The army hauled themselves out of the water behind him and shook themselves. At a glory and war, Morgan shouted. Follow me! The army waved their claws in the air and cheered. War! 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 They echoed in a frenzy. Barker tired. His arms drop off, whinged the unhappy rat. Piccadilly sighed wearily. His companion had not stopped moaning since they'd set off. The little red boat sailed round the old docks and the shores of Deptford came in sight. At last, the city mouse said, relieved. Look, Barker, we're nearly there now. At Deptford. And I think that hill beyond is Greenwich. Yes, that must be the observatory, do you see? Barker paddled miserably. He lowered his face when Greenwich was mentioned. Oh, I, I ain't going there, he muttered. And, and mousy boy can't make Barker. Piccadilly laughed. Ah, oh, don't worry. We don't have to go that far. Anywhere round here will do. Presently, the plastic bowl nudged the edge of the ice where old Stumpy's raft lay forlornly bobbing up and down. Piccadilly used his wooden spoon to keep his vessel steady. Yeah, well, we've got to get out of here, he told Barker. Careful, though, 
and we'll both be in the drink. Gingerly, they put paw and claw on the tingling ice and pulled themselves slowly out. Without their weight, the empty bowl popped up and tumbled over, quickly filling with freezing water and sinking without trace. Yeah, well, right, there are tracks over here, Piccadilly called out. Over here, he was studying the footprints made by Morgan's army. Snow was falling heavily, and in another ten minutes, they would have disappeared. They went up there, he said, pointing up at the jetty. If I hurry, I might be able to catch them and see what they're doing. The mouse took hold of Barker's claw, and he shook it vigorously. Thanks for helping me get here, chummy. But you don't have to come with me now. The rat blinked and shook his head. What will Barker do without Mousy Boy? I mean, don't send him away now. You don't, you don't, you don't know where he is. He'll, he'll freeze and starve on his own. Let him come with nice Mousy, please. Yes? Piccadilly smiled. OK, you can come. Just follow me and don't make a sound. He ran up the jetty, and with a secret sly grin, the rat scudded after. The jetty joined a narrow lane lined on one side by a block of flats, and on the other by a high brick wall. The wall held a door, barred by cruel-looking railings, but Piccadilly and Barker ducked under these and gazed at the power station before them. It was a solid, square building of old red brick, surrounded on three sides by overgrown waste ground which the snow had transformed into a vast white plain. Behind it glistened the frozen river. It was a forbidding, frozen place. Disquiet and fear seemed to flow from it. At the rear of the power station, Morgan had waddled over to a low, broken window and squeezed himself inside. Inside the power station, was an impossibly huge chamber. Slanting shafts of light grubbed through the filthy upper windows but failed to illuminate the immense gloom. The derelict building was crusted in frost and savage spears of blue ice were suspended from the lofty ceiling, transforming it into an immense cavern of crystals. Morgan grinned. Truly, this was an appropriate place for his lord. A frozen cathedral of inverted glassy spires, a fortress of cold, withering death. He peered into the glimmering distance to see if he could catch sight of his god. But all was still and silent. Here, let us in! bawled his army, stamping outside the window. Here, we're catching our deaths out here! Welcome, lads! <laughs> Welcome! That's right. You get in here. When they'd recovered from the gale outside, the shivering rats began to look about them. They whistled at the cruel beauty of the icicles, and they stared at the frost-blistered walls. Hey, what's, what's all this, then? they asked. Where's, uh, where's them whisker twitchers, eh? Morgan waved his claws for silence, and he led them to the middle of the empty building. No doubt you're all dying to know. Why I brought you here, eh? Too right, Stumpy, they replied, stomping their aching feet on the ice-rasping ground. They know this, he told them. There dwells here a power greater than the world has ever known, mightier than a mountain, wiser than the night, and stronger than death. The rats looked at one another. Really? He's flipped his lid, they mumbled in surprise. Are you idiots? snapped Morgan. Lice fodder! Listen, I speak the truth. He threw back his head and he raised his arms in exultation. Hear me, Lord of the deadly dark! he cried. Witness the subjects I bring to you. The army's initial astonishment at old Stumpy's sudden madness turned to anger as they smelled betrayal. They'd been tricked. They thought of the long, dreadful swim, and, and the growls snarled in their throats. They could have stayed in Holborn, after all. Yellow teeth were bared, and ground together as eyes shone red and blazed furiously at the piebald rat. The army closed tightly round him, with deadly intent and slavering jaws. At that moment, 
A terrific rumble shook the building, and they paused in alarm. Vinny drew his flat head into his shoulders and he looked up. <coughs> he screamed. His fellows stared at the icicle ceiling. There, forming amid the frost, were two large, cold eyes. It's him! they screeched, scrabbling over one another in panic. Morgan let loose a triumphant hooting laugh and backed away. As the shape of the grotesquely huge cat spirit formed high above, the wailing rats fought each other to get to the broken window, but it was no use. Jupiter laughed at their puny efforts, and his voice cut into their hearts like a knife of ice. Come, my subjects, he boomed. Worship me and my beautiful coal. The rats cried pitifully, cutting themselves on the broken glass in their struggle to get out, but it was too late. Jupiter roared, and his breath hailed down on them. The icicles broke from the ceiling, raining bitter death on the rats below. Screams and, and squeals seared the air as the rats were impaled by the ice spears. Their aim was deadly, smashing through the chest of every one of them. And in a moment, it was over. Not one rat was left alive. And that is the end of Side Two. Morgan staggered through the frozen corpses. With a sick stomach, he realized what he'd done. The rat had finally achieved everything he had desired, and now Jupiter had taken it from him. Morgan fell to his knees and wept for his lads. How could he have done this to them? Take your place at my side, Jupiter hissed at him. Be my high priest and commander of my armies. Morgan sobbed and hid his face. He was trapped and enslaved by this fiend forever. Bitterly, he agreed. What else could he do? Yes. Yes, my lord, he stammered sorrowfully. A shadow flicked across the broken window. With a shocked, appalled face, Piccadilly hurried away from the power station. He had seen it all and his mind was reeling. Scurrying behind came Barker. He wore an odd expression. The balmy rat seemed to be impressed rather than frightened. The mice of the skirtings were gathered round in the hall, hungry and afraid. Master Old Nose recited a prayer, calling on the green mouse for deliverance. Everyone joined in, paws clasped beneath their chins, and voices lifted in despair. Audrey would not take part. She knew that it was no good. The green mouse was dead and could not hear them. His powers for the spring and summer only. She wandered away from the far side, past the kneeling mice, to where the star wife rocked on her heels by the stairs. The old squirrel appeared worse than ever. Her tear-stained cheeks had caved in, and her fragile skull could plainly be seen. A milky eye fluttered open and focused smartly on the girl. Don't you fret, child, said the star wife hoarsely. You haven't got a corpse in your hall. Not yet. Thomas Triton joined them and stood fidgeting, his hat in his paws. He coughed. An eyelid opened slightly, showing a watery slice of clouded eye. What, uh, what do you want of me, Triton? The star wife asked in a flat voice. Can you not leave me in peace? No, I can't, he shouted in exasperation. What are you sitting there like Neptune's mother for, you silly old devil? Here's that foul fiend taking the stars away, and all you can do is mope about. And what do you suggest I do? She asked in a deceptively calm tone. What do you think I am able to do? Thomas shrugged. Well, I don't know, 
he answered frankly. But we must do something. I don't reckon this is the end of Jupiter's tricks. There'll be more. I'm certain of it. The star wife stared at our gnarled paws. But of course, he admitted. He will not stop yet. Not until he can be certain that spring will never come again. Oh, what, do you, what do you mean? asked the midget mouse. What else can he do? For pity's sake, you crafty old baggage. Will you not tell us what's going on? She turned her half-blind eyes full on him. And he was prevented from saying anything more by the power that poured out of them. He had riled her. And she proved that such an action was still dangerous. So be it, she raged. You shall know, and you shall tremble as I have. The squirrel glared round at the astonished mice as she harshly told them. The arm beast has destroyed the stars of the night. Next, you shall destroy the day star. And soon the same magic shall be used on the sun. All the mice in the hall gasped and squeaked. Thomas fumbled for words, but he was too stricken to say anything. Could it be true? Could Jupiter really blot out the sun? His legs wobbled as he sat himself down sharply in case he collapsed. All eyes stared at the old squirrel. Here, is this some sort of... Indoor picnic or what? The mice jumped with surprise and spun round. Arthur could not believe his eyes. Piccadilly! He shouted happily. The city mouse grinned from ear to ear as his friend rushed forward and shook his paw. Audrey pushed through the crowd and said sheepishly, Hello, Piccadilly. Oh, I'm glad you came back. I missed you. He blinked and was at a loss for words. He'd often wondered what her first words would be if ever they met again. But he never counted on, I missed you. He always thought that Audrey had disliked him. Hello, was all he managed to come up with. A light bloomed in her rich brown eyes and somewhere deep inside him was born an urge to kiss her. It alarmed him and he coughed and turned hastily away. I, I never thought we'd clap eyes on you again after you went off like that, said Arthur. W w why are you here? Piccadilly collected his wits and spoke seriously. Ah, it's a long story. Before he could say any more, he put his paw to his mouth. Oh, I nearly forgot. I brought someone with me. Oh? Who is it? asked Audrey. Where is he? He, um, well, I left him, um... Eh. Piccadilly stammered wearily, unsure of how to put it. Well, I left him in the cellar after we came through the grill. Ah, oh, don't leave him down there, ordered Thomas. Bring him in! But, um, you, you don't understand, Piccadilly tried to explain. Oh, oh, well. He cupped his mouth in his paws and yelled through the cellar door. Barker! Barker, you can come in now! A strange slapping slither came up the steps, and the mice stared at one another curiously. Um, Barker, come in, mousy boy, cried a croaky voice. Audrey backed away. Arthur scratched his ear and Thomas scowled. They recognised the sound of a rat when they heard one. An in waddled Barker. Most of the mice had never seen a rat before, but all knew how vicious they could be. They shrieked and scattered everywhere. Ah, oh, don't worry, folks, Piccadilly called out. He's harmless, I promise. They're just a bit nutty, that's all. The star wife was staring at Barker with no fear in her eyes. But her brows were wrinkled, and a curious look crossed her face. Piccadilly listened attentively to Thomas as the midship mouse brought him up to date with events. Is there, is there really nothing we can do? asked Arthur gloomily. If only I, I still had my, my mouse brass, perhaps... That would have helped, sighed Audrey. It, it worked before. For the first time, Barker spoke. Uh, Barker like pretty, pretty mouse danglers, he chattered brightly. 
him, him always wanted one, but all he ever had was, 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 was lump, lump, lump. Master Old Nose bristled and could not help stating acidly, Rats do not wear the brass. They are for mouse necks. Mouse necks only. Oh, the very idea. Barker waggled his tongue at the pompous creature. Oh, it's, it's not true, he retorted. Nya, 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 nya. Barker saw ones are there. But what about the star glass, began Arthur. Do you think we could get close enough to break it before Jupiter tries to use it again? Oh, now you'd never get near it, replied Piccadilly, shaking his head. You'd be speared before you got with it. Shh, said Thomas. He was watching Barker intently and wanted to know what he'd meant. Who did you see with a mouse brass? He asked the rat. Barker shrugged. Oh, uh, no, 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 remember, he replied with a sullen expression. Thomas slapped the floor angrily. Tell me, he demanded. The rat fell on his face. Don't hit Barker. No, no, no more lumps for him, please. No, all right, I'll tell him, I'll tell him. Old, old Stumpy it was. It was him that had shiny mouse metal. He, 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 he wore it off and he did. He, he said it were his good luck charm. Audrey leaned forward. The mouse brass, she asked breathlessly. What did it look like? Barker raised his frightened eyes to her and narrowed them as he replied. Well, it, it, it looked like a cat, it did. It, well, whiskers, you know. A murmur ran through the gathering. Audrey's brass, they uttered with surprise. Yeah, Morgan must have found it in the water before he swam to the city, breathed Piccadilly. Oh, what luck! Thomas grinned with excitement. So... Morgan holds the answer. If we can take the mouse brass from him and throw it at Jupiter, we might get rid of the old devil once and for all. In the shadows, the star wife listened to their confident plans and shook her head sadly. Then she choked back a cry. There, in the midst of the crowd, was Barker staring out at her with a malevolent gleam in his eyes was something that was familiar, and yet, what was it? He was not who he pretended to be. But who was he? While the plans were being discussed in the hall, Audrey had slipped quietly away to her bedroom in the skirtings. She untied the crumpled ribbon in her hair and put in its place a clean one of palest pink. And when everything looked right, she gave one last critical look in the mirror and turned to leave. Mother, she exclaimed in embarrassed surprise, how long have you been there? Oh, long enough, Gwen replied, shaking her head. Uh, you wanted to look your best for Piccadilly, didn't you? The girl hung her head. Yes, she admitted slowly. Her mother came forward and embraced her. Oh, my darling child. She breathed softly. You must forget the feelings that you have for him. Things have changed, and you must act responsibly. Like it or not, you are married. You are Mrs. Scuttle now, Twit's wife. Audrey burst into tears and buried herself in her mother's arms. In the light of the fire, Thomas looked round at the raised paws. It would be a dangerous mission, and he was not sure he could count on most of the mice. The midget mouse decided to choose the ones who had already proved their worth. He pointed at Arthur and Piccadilly. Right, he said, you'll do. Three of us should be enough for one scurvy rat as long as we can get him away from the power station. Yeah, well, we'll have to be quick, said Piccadilly, getting to his feet. We can't hang about waiting for his nibs to use the star glass again, can we? Barker had been picking his scalp throughout the discussion as though he wasn't listening. Now he jerked upright and he asked, oh, where's, where's Mousy boy going, didn't he? I mean, you, he can't leave Barker now. Piccadilly patted the old rat on his head. Ah, you stay here, you old loon, he told him. You'll be looked after, don't worry.
the barker jumped up. Oh, please, mousy boy, he squealed. A barker not like to be left out. I'm, he can help against old Stumpy. I mean, you need to get him alone. I mean, he knows Barker, um, Barker who can lure him out of his ice fortress. Yes? Thomas regarded the rat with astonishment. He's right, you know, he said. I think your barmy old friend ain't so addled as he pretends to be. The evening closed tightly about the power station, and charcoal shadows lengthened over the icy waste. The storm still raged, and black, snow-swollen clouds filled the sky. Thomas, followed by the other three, grunted as he laboured with increasing difficulty through waist-high snow. When he reached the wall of the building, he pressed himself against the frost-covered bricks and spoke in a whisper to Barker. Right, this is where you earn your supper, he said. Remember, all you have to do is to lead Morgan out here, and we'll take over. Barker lifted his face and stared intently at the window with a broken pane. There was a movement behind it. Morgan was there, lurking in the gloom, spying and snooping, keeping watch for his foul master. Barker licked his lips, and the act of his life began. Oh, oh, me, head. oh, them lumps, oh, 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 oh. Behind the broken window, a dark shape flitted, and two beady red eyes gleamed in the cold dark as Morgan glared out into the storm. I know that miserable voice, he snarled. It's that crazy old duffer. What's he doing here? He can't have swum all this way. A vicious-looking dagger flashed in his teeth as he wormed his way out of the window. Amid the swirling storm, Barker howled, Help! Help me! Help me, Arm! I said, and I can't, and I can't walk properly. Oh, oh. Morgan cackled as his stumpy tail slapped the frost eagerly. Tell me where you are, he called out. It's me, your beloved general. <laughs> I'll help you. The crafty old rat was now lying flat against the ground. I was over here. I was over here quick. Quick. With a growl, Morgan leapt forward, brandishing the dagger and he ran right past Barker's prostrate form. In the glimmering dark, he lashed out with a cruel blade, slashing the snow and cutting the wind in his madness to find the old rat. Where are you? he shrieked. Barker pulled himself up, and he pulled himself over to the shadowy corner where the mice were hiding. He's out, and alone, he told them quickly. And he's got, he's got the dangler. Round his scrawny neck. Thomas turned to the others. Ready? Piccadilly and Arthur nodded grimly, and with one bound they all shot out of the darkness and raced through the blizzard. Morgan whipped round, and he saw the three mice charging at him. He cried out and he tried to dodge back to the window, but his escape was cut off by Thomas, and a rapier was thrust menacingly before his face. Arthur swiftly swung his stick, and he caught the rat's claw. The dagger dropped to the ground and Morgan yelped. Piccadilly's paw was steady as he held his own little knife and approached purposefully. This disgusting creature had been the cause of all his miseries. Morgan stared, open-mouthed at the city mouse. Ah, I know you, he cried. You're a hole borner And before that, you were in the sewers. You're the dainty that got away. Piccadilly said nothing but came fiercely on. Morgan! snapped Thomas suddenly. We only want that brass around your neck. Give it to us, or we'll take it, and we'll not be gentle. Considering that the rat was cornered and weaponless, he seemed very sure of himself. <laughs> he laughed, holding his sides. Oh, so that's what you're up to, is it? Are you cretinous scum? Nothing can harm, my lord. Certainly not some poxy bauble. He's grown too strong for that. 
and he continued to hoot with mocking laughter. <laughs> Here, give it to us! Give it to us, ordered Piccadilly. He ran forward and grasped the rat by the throat. Morgan jumped backwards, and he threw the mouse off balance. Piccadilly fell down into the snow, and his knife spun in the air, only to be caught in cruel claws. Don't deal in death, lad, Morgan whispered harshly in his ear as he pressed the knife against Piccadilly's own throat. Not when your victim's a master of the craft. I've murdered and butchered more flesh than you're ever likely to see. He glanced up at Thomas and Arthur and told them to back off. Yeah, that's right, my lovelies, Morgan cooed. If you don't want to see your little grey friend skinned in front of you, keep away. And then he lifted his head, and an insane cackle gurgled from his throat as he looked beyond them. Piccadilly squirmed in alarm as he saw the dreadful horror gather behind his friends. Behind you! he managed to cry defiantly. Hideous forms had poured out of the power station and mustered silently behind them. All of Morgan's rats had returned in spectral form. Their eye sockets were empty, and they stared blankly out at the frozen world. The faces of the apparitions still held the tortured look of their hideous deaths and hollow wails echoed into the night from their gaping, dead mouths. Their haunted claws each held the spear that had killed him, and the icy spikes were stained black with their own blood. They were tightly bound to their new master. His will it was that drove them, for in each of their chests a spark of cold starfire blazed. Morgan threw back his head and let loose a high-pitched screech of a laugh. <laughs> and what do you think of my new army? You are most honored. Your lives will be the first that they will take. He kicked the winded Piccadilly to one side and ran to be among the phantom rats. With horrible, tormented shrieks, the dead warriors surged forward. Thomas sprang towards them with his rapier, plunging the sharp blade directly into the heart of one. He thrashed the rapier up and down, tattering the dreadful spirit into a thousand pieces. But the wispy fragments melted, and merged together once more, and the awful, lolling head mocked him. In a final effort, the midship mouse sliced through the crackling white starfire, which pulsed and glowed in the breast of the hellish thing. He cried out as a spitting, ravenous frost shot out and devoured the steel blade, turning it to brittle ice which splintered and smashed on the ground. Thomas's paw became a hoary white as the blood in his fingers froze. Run! he shouted. The three mice pelted back over the waste ground as fast as they could and behind them in deadly pursuit flowed the legion of wraiths. They hurled their ice spears at them, and the glinting missiles soared through the night and came crashing closely on their heels. Ah! screamed Thomas as a spear sliced through his leg. He toppled over and crashed to the ground. The wound was deep, and the blood oozed out over the snow, but it was no ordinary gash. Almost immediately... A festering frost stole over the exposed flesh. The midget mouse groaned with pain. Go, he shouted at Arthur. Leave me, I'm done for. No, I won't, Arthur cried. Give me your arm. He tried to pull Thomas to his feet, but it was no use. The army was upon them. Piccadilly turned round to see what was happening. He'd outdistanced his friends and was appalled to witness the terrifying spectres bearing down on them. With his fists clenched, he ran forward, bellowing for all he was worth. Holborn! he bawled. A claw snatched out of the darkness and caught his arm. But it was flesh and blood. Mousy! called Barker breathlessly. Use your head! You can't save them like that! Piccadilly stared into the old rat's eyes, confused and bewildered by what he saw there. A commanding light gleamed in those cunning bottomless pools. Uh, leave it to Barker, the rat said sternly. He bounded out towards the shadowy host and called out strange-sounding words. Suddenly, the phantoms faltered. 
The star fire dimmed in their hearts as they moaned and put down their spears. To the mice's astonishment, Barker came crashing through the uncertain spirits and flung a battered oil can at Thomas's feet. You tinderbox, Triton, the rat instructed sharply. Hurry, or the confusion will not last long. Thomas fumbled in the turn-up of his hat where he kept his tinderbox. Quickly he struck a spark, and the oil that had spilt out of the can burst into golden flames on the deep snow. The spectres fell back, gasping and clawing the air, dismayed at the heat and the light. Arthur let Thomas lean on him. He could see that the wound was hurting the midship mouse. Come on, Mr. Triton, he said urgently. We must get away from here. Barker was not smiling as he eyed the retreating legion cautiously. Hurry, he told Piccadilly. Their fear will not last long. Their master will pour more hate and malice into the star far which controls them. Then attack again. Piccadilly did not seem to notice that, that the rat was now speaking in a totally different voice. For he saw Thomas come hobbling towards him, leaning heavily on Arthur. Uh, we, we must get back the curtains, Thomas said, wincing at the gnawing agony of his leg. As Arthur ducked under the railings and waited for the midshipmaster to follow, Barker yanked Piccadilly's arm and spun him round. Look, mousy boy, he said triumphantly. Do you see him now? Piccadilly frowned at the rat, but his eyes fell on the hundreds of spirits wailing and swaying aimlessly in the firelight. Already they were braving the heat and drawing nearer to the flames as the star fire urged them on. The flames fell on the twisted faces and the city mouse turned pale as his stomach lurched. There was the shade of Vinny, the loathsome standard bearer, and above his head the banner still fluttered. Piccadilly had not seen it before, and now his heart stopped, and a desperate cry formed on his quivering lips. For the standard was made out of mouse skin. The paws were tied around the pole, and two small icicles marked where the eyes had been, and the legs flapped behind madly in the wild wind. But over the main section, the area that was once a mouse's back, there ran a jagged bolt of darker fur that resembled a flash of lightning. Marty! screamed Piccadilly. There, waving forlornly in the storm, was all that remained of his young friend. Piccadilly's anger scorched his brain. Morgan had to die. He was blind to everything else. He charged the wailing spirits who were now stalking fearlessly through the fire. Their unclean paws tore at his fur as he thundered past and savage spears hailed after him. Morgan was standing near the pane of broken glass, braced against the gale and cackling wickedly. His new army was magnificent. He tossed back his ugly head and he hooted with pleasure. But the laughter died in his throat as Piccadilly came out of the storm to confront him. A terrible light was shining in the mouse's eyes and the rat stiffened with surprise. He looked for his army but they were pursuing Thomas and Arthur over the jetty. Morgan was on his own. Piccadilly bared his teeth. Time's up, Stumpy! He snarled, prowling forward. The rat glared at him and drew himself up haughtily. Get out of my sight! He growled threateningly. I've had bigger than you for breakfast, lad! The knife he'd taken from Piccadilly glinted in his claw, and with it he struck out suddenly and slashed to the city mouse's chest. Piccadilly gritted his teeth and he clutched his breast. The blood welled up between his fingers, but he did not care. All his sorrows and fury volcanoed inside him, and with a mad yell he exploded into the piebald rat, bowling him over like a rag doll. The mouse threw himself on top of Morgan who shrieked as the blows fell, one after the other. A paw stronger than iron hammered into his belly, and a bloody mixture of spit and broken teeth spurted from his mouth. 
Hawken wriggled, and the knife flashed up across his attacker's arm. Piccadilly caught his breath as the steel wove a net of cruel light around him. With one paw, he tried to catch the claw that wielded it, while the other closed around Morgan's throat. The bitter blade cut into his fingers, but he grasped the rat's claw and he forced it back, squeezing like a vice. The knife fell from Morgan's clutches and he writhed violently. His stumpy tail writhed like a headless serpent beating against the mouse's back and he craned his neck to bite anything he could reach. Piccadilly heaved his knee up under Morgan's chin and the snapping jaws cracked shut as he stretched for the knife. His dripping fingers closed around the handle and with a deadly grin he brought his face close to his enemies. Now, now I've got ya, hissed the mouse as the blade was pushed against Morgan's ribs. Just one shove and your history. What's it like, Morgan? Are you excited? The resigned calm had descended upon the rat. He closed his beady eyes, and when he opened them, all traces of fear had gone. Right? Kill me. Kill me, I'll not beg, he croaked. Don't you say that a swift end will be better than what he has in store for me? Go on, lad. Plunge the blade in. Feel what it's like to kill. Just one small step, and you'll be a rat, good and proper. He rested his head to one side, weary at last of the world. Finish me off, boy. Let me cheat him of my service. Let me get one over him. Just once. At the end. Knife and Piccadilly's paws trembled as the mouse shook all over. He teetered on the brink, and then snapped out of his madness. He was no rat. A shuddering sigh swept through him as he realised how foolish he'd been about many things. And a joyous laugh rang out in that dreadful place as his noble side won through. Never, he said, tucking the knife into his belt. You don't understand, and you never will. That's what makes you a rat. You see, I trust in the green mouse. Morgan snarled and snatched the knife from the belt. Ah, good for you, lad, he shouted. But this rat's no cat's paw anymore. Before Piccadilly could stop him, Morgan raised the knife and plunged it deep into his own heart. There, there in the steady snowfall, Jupiter's lieutenant gasped and died. In the gloom, Morgan looked at peace, a smile of restful contentment on his lips. At last, he had escaped the chains of his dark master once and for all. Audrey's brass gleamed in Piccadilly's paws as he cut it free of the cord. A hush seemed to settle on the power station, cutting off the noise of the gales outside. Into this enclosed, deserted wilderness stepped Piccadilly and the sound of his breathing rang like an alarm. He raised his voice and shouted, Show yourself! But only the eerie calm answered him. The air was still and even the faint tinkling ceased. Where are you, Jupiter? he called. Are you afraid of one little mouse? For a moment nothing happened, and then the fog began to disperse, pulling itself away, tearing in ragged shreds and fading into dark corners. A deep rumble obliterated the silence and the ground quaked under the mouse's feet. The walls shook and the high windows cracked and splintered. Glass fell shivering to the floor, smashing and crashing into a million shards. Two pale swells of blue light formed far above in the velvet gloom between the icicles. 
They burned with the bitterness of the empty void. And as Piccadilly looked at them, they blazed and grew until they were huge, baleful lamps of distilled evil. In a rush of frozen breath, Jupiter spoke, and the sound of his voice cut through Piccadilly like a thousand knives. Puny creature! How dare you enter my realm? The city mouse stood his ground and held the brass before his face. My name's Piccadilly, he shouted proudly. And by the power of the green mouse, I banish you forever. He leaned back and flung the charm as hard as he could. Audrey's brass whisked through the darkness, gleaming as it spun. Jupiter snarled as the mouse brass sailed up towards him, and then, with a mighty blast that split the walls and loosened the bricks, he blew hard and furiously. The mouse brass was left spinning helplessly in midair as the demon's breath hailed violently down. The frost roared out of the unbounded mouth and struck the mouse brass with tremendous force. The yellow metal dripped with rime and turned white. The charm lurched. And with a loud crack, it became ice. And like a stone, it plummeted towards the ground where it smashed the smithereens. Piccadilly stared at the fragments that littered the floor. The anti-cat charm was completely destroyed. Jupiter laughed. Hi, you think, uh, to fling trifling toys at me? He stormed. Know that Jupiter is invincible, and you are defeated. The mouse staggered back, stumbling in his fear. He was defenseless and alone. He'd never felt so small in his life. Run! The enormous spirit mocked. Escape if you can. Piccadilly ran for the broken window. And hideous laughter filled his ears. Too late, Jupiter whispered. Ridiculous insect, your struggles are ended. And there, pouring in, blocking the exit, was the phantom army. The spectres opened their hollow jaws and let out a, a horrible wail. The ice spears left their claws and shot grimly through the air. And the power station boomed with Jupiter's laughter. The small body lay motionless on the ground. The face turned heavenwards. Piccadilly's little paw was closed tightly around his own mouse brass, kept fastened to his belt. It was the sign of hope but with his life, that too ended in that dark place. Arthur squirmed through the rusted iron leaves of the grill. He heaved a weary sigh and turned Paul Thomas out. The midship mouse ground his teeth when his leg dragged against one of the metal fronds. A shudder of agony rifled up his thigh as the ugly gash wept poisoned black blood and... The skin around it turned blue. A black sickness was creeping over him as the infection took hold. Everything was growing dim, and a drowning darkness rose all around. He felt a, a black gulf yawn under his feet, ready to swallow him whole. Mouse overboard! he cried wildly, waving his paws in the air. He's going under! Save him, me boys! Save him! The midship mouse slithered to the floor and lay there as the ice fever seized him altogether. The hall was bathed in the orange glow of the fire. All around its lazy, lapping flames, the slumbering shapes of the blanket-shrouded mice snored and dreamed of harvest feasts. Into this troubled peace burst Arthur. He fell, stumbling through the cellar door, and called at the top of his voice. Help! Help! Wake up! It's Mr. Triton! He's down there! He's been wounded! 
Uh, please go and help him. Master Old Nose and Mr. Cockle pushed through the doorway and vanished into the darkness beyond. Gwen came running up to her son, full of concern. What happened? she asked. Is he badly hurt? Arthur nodded. Gwen looked at the doorway and clenched her paws tightly. Several other mice had gone down to help bring up the midship mouse, and already they were carrying him into the hall. She drew her breath sharply when she saw the terrible wound. His leg was now immovable, but transformed absolutely into ice. They put him next to Arthur, and when the warm firelight fell on his face, Thomas opened his eyes. He raised a trembling paw to the flames, but the effort was too much, and he descended into the black swoon once more. What happened, Arthur? Gwen asked again as she tended to the midship mouse and tried to make him comfortable. Oh, Jupiter! Jupiter has an army of ghosts, said Arthur, shivering at the memory. And they, they threw spears at us, and one of them hit Mr. Triton. It was only a flesh wound, but it got steadily worse. There's, there's some evil magic at work in it. Audrey had grown very pale and silent. And now, with a small voice, she asked, Where's Piccadilly, Arthur? Why isn't he here with you? Arthur shook his head and sobbed. Oh, I, I don't know, we were coming back when all of a sudden he... He went mad and he charged back to the power station. Barker went to get him, but I don't know what happened to either of them. The anguish of loss stole in and closed about Audrey's heart. Gwen did not know what to do about Thomas's leg. Splinters of frost were now edging their way up to his waist. His breathing was faint and his face drawn, a shadow of his former robust self. It's the winter sickness, barked a cracked voice behind her. Gwen turned, and the star wife staggered into the light. The forces of Hagal have been invoked, she told the frightened mice in a hushed, ominous tone. Ancient powers long idle have been kindled by the unbeast, and the spears of Marmoth fly once more. I fear that the sea mouse will die. Oh, Thomas... Thomas, Gwen wept forlornly. Audrey looked on all this as though she were observing it through a window. It was a strange sensation, and for a few moments she felt apart from them and their grief in a separate, tranquil world. And then it was over, and the babble of voices clamoured round again. She shook herself, and the fragments of her heart went out to her mother. Only they could do something. She paused. There it was again. The noise died down and she was viewing her family as though she was cut off from them. Audrey did not know what was happening. She looked around nervously. And there was the star wife, regarding her with keen eyes. The squirrel glowered, but Audrey's spirits lifted. Somehow she'd read the other's thoughts. The real world snapped back, and with a determined, angry expression, Audrey rose and strode briskly over to where the star wife was tapping her stick in agitation. Keep away! Keep away from me, child! said the squirrel tersely. But there was a hint of caution in her voice, and she backed away. Audrey caught hold of her stick and held it firmly. You can heal him, can't you? Can't you? she declared furiously. I know you can. I sensed what was running through that nasty, dried-up old brain of yours. You were telling yourself what a waste of time it would be, as we were all going to die soon anyway. That's right, isn't it, you mean old hag? What a clever creature you are, said the star wife. Yes, it's true. I may be able to heal the midship mouse. Then why don't you? Well, as you said... We shall all be destroyed soon. What would I be saving Triton for? His fate may be sweet compared to what awaits us. Well, you can give Thomas a chance to live, answered Audrey, outraged. 
How dare you stand there and decide how someone should die when you have the means to save them? The star wife considered the girl's words. Yes, yes, you, you may be right, she admitted. I will restore Triton, but, but only, only on one condition. I'm sick to death of your conditions, flamed Audrey. What is it now? Nothing too taxing, said the squirrel with a curious smile. I merely ask for your help in this. That is all. Well, I'll do anything. Then go and find my bag. The star wife examined the ice-covered body beside her. The infection had reached Thomas's shoulders, and frosty lines were creeping relentlessly up his neck. Well, there is uh, very little time left for him, she said bluntly. The dread spells of Jupiter speed through his system. Give me the bag, child. Audrey passed it over, and the star wife foraged inside. She brought out a curiously shaped root and deftly bit the end off. A honey-coloured sap oozed out, and she held it over the gash, allowing three drops to fall into it. Thomas cried out as each drop touched the dreadful wound. Gwen held his head and stroked his hair soothingly, but his eyes rolled back. Only the whites showed. The star wife removed the silver acorn from around her neck and dangled it between three fingers over the midship mouse. With her arm outstretched, she sighed, and strange words formed on her wrinkled lips. The hall became tense, and a faint breeze stirred moving her patchy fur and gently swinging the suspended charm. What? Ha! Uh, ah! scolded the star wife as her arm sagged suddenly and the acorn touched Thomas. She snorted with contempt at her own feeble limbs and rubbed her wasted muscles feverishly. With a grunt of frustration, she told everyone, Oh, it is useless. I can, I can do nothing for him. My, my arms are... My arms are too weak for this. The mice all let out a disappointed groan. Audrey looked at the squirrel sharply. There was something exceedingly odd about what had just happened. It was too like a performance to be true. She had an idea and hurriedly volunteered. All right, I'll do it. There, she thought. That's put a stop to the old battle axes delaying tactics. The star wife offered the girl a pendant. She took it, and the squirrel smiled almost with relief. Excellent, she said. Now, hold it over him steadily, child, she told Audrey, and do not move or drop it until the process is complete. She gazed round and raised her paw for attention. Begin now, all of you. She instructed the mice. If you want this mouse to live, you must concentrate with all your might. Only the sound of the fire was heard as the assembled mice prayed hard, and the star wife closed her eyes and spoke softly under her breath. Audrey looked suspiciously at the squirrel and wondered what her motives were. She had given in to her request to heal Thomas too easily. There had to be a reason for it. The silence lengthened, and the whisperings of the squirrel grew more heated as she summoned all her remaining strength. With her left paw, she touched Audrey deliberately on the forehead and pressed her nail into the fur, combing a circular shape there. May this new vessel serve you well, she cried. Suddenly, Audrey became aware of a faint humming sound in her ears, and then a shudder ran down her arms to her paws. She felt a, a colossal force travel through her, and she, she spluttered with shock. A cold chill coursed in her veins and passed into her fingers. The acorn was glowing, and the humming grew louder until it filled the hall. A high, piercing note charging the atmosphere and tingling every astonished whisker. 
brilliance flooded from the charm, and the mice shielded their eyes from the blinding light and stopped up their ears as the shrill note deafened them. The star wife began to cry out the spell she was chanting, and she raised her arms ecstatically. The hall blazed fiercely white, and then, with a thunderous crash and a terrific rush of air, the radiance fled screeching down to Thomas, battering into his frozen body and leaving the house in darkness. Thomas called out in pain. The anguish and agony twisted his face. It was killing him. So this was the star wife's plan. She had said it would be better to finish him off now, but she had tricked them into, into letting her do it. Stop it, shrieked Audrey, and she tried to throw the acorn away. But the star wife reached out and seized hold of her paws, gripping them tightly, bruising the girl's wrists with her iron grasp. He's dying, you old witch, protested Audrey, as more liquid ice poured from the amulet and totally smothered Thomas. Even as Audrey struggled and wrested her paws free, the white fires died down and disappeared into the floor. She flung the pendant from her, but it was too late. Thomas was completely covered, and she gazed only at a statue of ice. A wintry vapour steamed from the grisly figure. It was too horrible to look at, and many turned their stricken faces away. Before anyone could speak, the star wife took up her stick and gave the rigid form a sound rap. There was a crack, and two great lines splintered away from the blow. What are you doing? wailed Gwen desolately. The squirrel ignored her and gave it another mighty clout, and another. The ice crunched and shattered flying into the air in little sharp pieces until it was completely destroyed. And there, blinking and gasping for breath, was Thomas, alive and well. He brushed off the icy fragments, and he sat up grinning as if nothing had ever been the matter with him. Oh, I couldn't have to have a tot of rum, he said ruefully. And that is the end of side three. Audrey felt foolish. She looked at the squirrel and hung her head. How wrong she had been for not trusting her. She glanced round for the silver acorn. It had rolled into a dusty corner. She ran over and picked it up, and then with a sheepish face she took it to the squirrel. I... I brought this back for you, she said meekly. The squirrel chuckled. No, oh, and what would I want that for, young lady? Well, it's your acorn, your symbol of office. <laughs> snorted the star wife. Oh, no, not any more. You took it of your own free will and allowed the powers to channel through you. The charm is mine no longer. I don't understand, began Audrey. But even as she said it, she realized she had been tricked once again. The squirrel nodded. Oh, oh yes, she laughed softly. It, it belongs to you now. My time is over. Yeah, but, but I don't want it, protested Audrey. The other dismissed her with a shake of her head. Oh, too late, she said, melting into the shadow. Oh, too late, you claimed it. And it claimed you it is yours. Whether you like it or not, there is there is not you can do. And with that, the star wife vanished into the darkness. Audrey looked down at the silver acorn in her palm and tossed her head defiantly. I'm not your slave, she pouted, and I'm not having your rotten pendant. And with a furious shout, she hurled the charm away and heard it rattle down the cellar steps. The snow lay deep over the yard. The wind had dropped, and the flakes were falling steadily. The star wife stared woefully at the black void of the heavens. No more of the celestial lamps do shine, she crooned sorrowfully. And the enemy stalks 
a moonless night. With a last regretful glance, she lowered her gaze and prepared herself for what had to be done. With her stick, the squirrel drew a circle in the snow. When it was complete, she carefully placed seven stones at an equal distance from each other round the ring. And then she stood in the centre and touched each one with the handle of her stick and said a blessing over them. The wheel is made, she sighed when it was done. The star wife touched her back as she bent her knees and tried to sit down. Oh, I have waited too long, she chided herself as her spine buckled, and she landed unceremoniously on the icy ground. My time should have ended long, long ago. She sucked her bottom lip thoughtfully and laid the stick across her lap. Now all that is left for me to do is to wait. I pray that it comes quickly. Between the posts of the fence, a dark shape weaved and flitted. Ah, oh, what, what have we here? scoffed a voice. What dainty scene is this? The star wife looked up stiffly, and then uttered a little gasp of surprise, as into the pale light walked Barker. You, she cried. What are you doing here after all these years? Your time is gone. You should not be walking again. I count you more dangerous than Jupiter. At this the rat shook his head. Oh, oh no, he breathed. Oh no, he, he's mightier than I ever imagined. He, he has a phantom host at his command and he, he sets at naught the power of the green. With these very eyes, I saw him destroy the mouse brass. <laughs> Nothing can defeat him. It was the star wife's turn to smile. So that is why you came, she said with understanding. Your task was to learn the unbeast's strength. You thought you could usurp him, did you? And raise the three unholy thrones once more. She laughed at him contemptuously. Barker paced round the circle and rubbed his claws together. Ah, he squealed hysterically. Ah, yeah, yeah, where, where were my eyes? Your acorn is gone. No longer are you the drab of the firmament. Your line has ended. Uh, there's no one left to inherit the silver. All rains must falter at the last, but what an ignoble finish to your high and mighty monarchy. <laughs> he strutted away back into the darkness beneath the fence. We shall not meet again, star wife, he called back to her. And then with a riotous hoot, he tutted at his mistake. Oh, but of course, he corrected himself. That title is no longer yours, is it? <laughs> You've relinquished it. Now, let me see. I must call you by your birth name, he hesitated. Um, what is it, I ask myself? It is a simple name said the squirrel, weary of his derision and mockery. In my youth, oh, they called me Audrey. That was my name. Then, goodbye, Audrey, Parker called, his voice laced with respect. He slipped away and departed through the night. Goodbye, Bauchen, whispered the squirrel quietly, as the slow, secret smile formed on her lips. The snow fell monotonously, and her chin dropped to her breast as she succumbed at last to the cruel weather, and the midwinter death harvested her. It was Algie Coltfoot who found the star wife's body. What? he screamed, running back to the house. Help! Help! Presently, the less squeamish of the skirting's mice were in the yard. Thomas had hobbled there with Arthur's assistance. He removed his hat and he touched his forehead. Oh, you're, 
I never had a chance to thank you, he whispered. Audrey came out, impatient to know what was happening, and looked in astonishment at the old creature's face. She's smiling, she said hoarsely. Thomas put his paw on Audrey's shoulder. Or have you still got the Star Wife's bag, he asked. But she nodded, and he sent her to fetch it. We must build a pyre over her, he explained. I know that is what she would have wanted. We must use the rest of the wood stored for use inside. Uh, you, 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 you cannot do that, snapped Master Old Nurse, outraged. Uh, what are we to do, then? Gwen pressed her paw into Thomas's. He's right, she said. We need the wood more than a star wife will, dear. But he would not be dissuaded. You don't realize how important she was, he bellowed. This was the handmaiden of Orion, keeper of the star glass, the green's regent on earth. Damn your eyes, she was the closest thing to divinity you're ever likely to see. I'm sorry, Thomas, Mrs. Brown found herself saying. I was wrong. Of course we must honor the star wife. At the end of an hour, a tall fire had been built. Thomas inspected the work and nodded. It was ready to be lit. And as the pyre was being constructed, he racked his brains to try and remember the exact words. The mice joined paws and formed a ring while they waited for him to begin. Under the stars, we are as one, he said, bowing in reverence. Theirs is the power of countless years. They see our grief, and they know our pain. And yet still, they shine. Everyone felt the irony of the speech, and shook their heads as Thomas finished by saying, And their light, their light gives us hope. He fumbled for the rest of the words, swearing at his forgetfulness. It was something to do with trees and, and wheels, wasn't it? From acorn to oak, began a voice unexpectedly. Thomas turned and saw it was Audrey. She came forward, bearing the velvet bag. But even the mightiest of oaks shall fall, she intoned. Thus do we recognize the great wheel of life and death and life once more. We surrender our departed soul under the stars... And may the green gather her to him. She lifted her face to the blank white sky and raised her paws. Light the pyre, she told Thomas. He took the tinderbox obediently from the turn-up of his hat and used it to kindle the paper lodged between the sticks. A pale, wavering flame trembled in the wind, but it caught the wood and crackled hungrily. Soon, the whole thing was ablaze. The snow in the yard melted as the heat hammered out from it. Audrey opened the star wife's bag. There were only a few dried leaves and herbs left in it, but she emptied them out onto her palm and cast them into the flames. Speed to the green, she commanded. The fire splattered, and for a moment... Tiny stars of emerald spat and fizzled in its heart. Almost immediately, the blackened branches crumbled and collapsed. The flames dwindled, and the snow that had melted iced over as the temperature plummeted once again. It is done, said Audrey. It would be better if we went inside now. Everyone looked at her curiously. Not least Thomas, who wondered how she had known the correct words when she'd never heard them before. But they admitted it was too cold to remain outside any longer, and hurried indoors to escape the wind. The hall was not much warmer. Even when they plugged up the hole in the kitchen, the extreme chill of winter lingered. Suddenly, there was a curious scraping noise. It's coming from out there, cried Arthur running to the great boarded-up front door. The noise continued to screech, and then suddenly, bang, 
The door buckled and sent Arthur reeling backwards. Bang! There it was again, and the mice squeaked with fright. Bang! 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 The door quivered as the pounding blows became a battering frenzy. Oh, Thomas, said Gwen. Who is it? What does it want? But he did not answer, for at that moment the door cracked and splinters sharp as needles flew out. The mice shrieked and cowered back as far as they could. A chink of light appeared in the towering expanse of fracturing wood, and sawing and cutting through it as though it were paper, a vicious point of ice jabbed its way in. Another glaring hole was punched out, and a second stabbing icicle forced the splitting wood inwards. Ice spears, gasped Arthur. He sent his army to get us. More of the evil spears smashed into the door, and to everyone's horror, phantom claws reached through the jagged holes they'd made, groping and searching for prey. Thomas shook himself out of his terror. Right, they'll be through soon, he shouted. Quick, everyone, into the cellar. To my ship we'll go, and then who knows? Shrieking for their lives, the mice surged through the cellar door and poured down the stone steps. Through the grill! Quickly, Arthur called. Nervously, they began to scramble through the rusted gap in the ornate ironwork. Whilst, from up above, there came a sickening crash as the door finally gave way to the phantom horde. At this, everyone squealed and pushed harder to escape from those terrible spears. Careful! roared Thomas. You'll crush the little ones! When there was only a dozen or so left to pass through, Thomas glanced warily up the steps. He could hear the horrible moans of the wraiths dragging their ice spears over the wreckage. Come on, Thomas whispered urgently as the last of the mice disappeared into the gloom beyond the metal leaves. The midship mouse fell to his knees and scrabbled through. Just as he whipped his tail in, an ice spear crashed onto the floor behind. A long, miserable line of mice stretched far into the evil-smelling distance. Thomas came limping up at the rear and shouted to the front where he presumed Arthur was. You there, matey! he yelled. The sewers snatched up his voice, and it boomed through them like a gong. I'm here, Mr. Triton, answered a smaller echo. Do you remember the way to Greenwich, lad? Thomas called. I think so, said the reply. Then lead on, matey! Slowly the great queue shuffled along, and with a last worried glance backwards, Thomas followed. Audrey was sandwiched between her mother and Mrs. Chitter, who complained incessantly, whinging at the state of her muddy toes and constantly blaming her husband for bringing her down here. And then, then it happened again. The sewers and the sound of Mrs. Chitter's mewling faded far away and she felt herself drift blissfully away from them. Go back! said a soft voice in her head. Return to the garden. Go back. Go back. Oh, oh my. Oh my, exclaimed surprised Mrs. Chitter as the girl pushed past her. Audrey, called Gwen, turning round. Where are you going? Stop her, someone. Fighting her way through the astonished line of mice, she bustled and squirmed. A fierce determination had seized her, and the urge to return home was overwhelming. She shrugged off the paws that tried to catch her, and kicked those who stood stubbornly in her way. Right now then, lass, barked a stern voice, and two strong paws gripped her shoulders. What's this in aid of, then, eh? Out of my way, Triton, snapped Audrey furiously. I have to get back at once. She glared into his eyes, and her temper flared. Crawl back into your bottle and let me go, she demanded haughtily. Thomas flinched, as though he'd been hit, and released her. She sounded exactly like the star wife. He tugged his hat in respect, and stepped aside. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am, he said automatically. The narrow passage that led to the grill was now lined with frost, and gleaming icicles dripped from the ironwork. Cautiously, Audrey crawled between the wintry stalactites and looked out of the grating to the cellar beyond. Only a fine layer of twinkling rime covering everything had told her 
that they had been there at all. When she reached the hall, it was empty, save for the devastation left by the ghosts. It must have been a crazed, brutal attack to have done so much damage in so little a time. It was a shocking sight, but Audrey was unmoved. Her sole objective was to get to the yard, and nothing, even this, would stop her. She ran into the kitchen and tore the stuffing from the hole that led outside, and emerged into the freezing white world. The full force of the cold hit her, and Audrey lost all sensation in her toes. She shook herself, and the desperate instinct to return melted away. What was she doing here? Her mind was in chaos as she tried to remember what had made her return. Perhaps she was going insane. Audrey put a paw to her forehead to steady herself. In the centre of the yard were the remains of the Star Wife's pyre. Audrey gazed fixedly at it, and her eyes grew wide and round. And poking out of the cinders was a small green shoot. She hurried over, amazed that anything could grow so quickly in this severe cold. Bewildered at this miracle, Audrey stretched out her paw, but as she touched it, the bulb it came away in her fingers, and she lifted it gently from the ashes. The girl marvelled at the tiny green blade in her palm. It gave her hope. It seemed to show that Jupiter had not destroyed everything. Somehow, nature would always fight through. She tucked the delicate plant into the waistband of her dress and decided it was time to leave. She hurried to the hole in the wall and ran into the kitchen once more. Now her only thought was to get back to her family. She walked hastily through the hall and only relaxed when the cellar door was behind her. Past the pile of boxes and bric-a-brac, she hastened to the grill. She knelt down before the entrance and above her head a fine tendril of fog curled as a flicker of star fire shot between the gratings. With a rasping hiss, a ghostly claw flashed out and swiped the air. Audrey screamed as more arms flailed out of the grill, and the chilling wails of the spectral army filled the cellar. Evil talons tore at her. One of them snatched the ribbon and shredded it in her hair. Another sliced a vicious cut across her arm. Spears glinted beyond the ironwork and Grizzly cackles issued from dead throats. A face pressed against one of the holes and leered blindly at her. Audrey whirled round and fled in horror as a cruel, glittering spike jabbed out and sailed through the darkness. It smashed only inches from her head as she clambered up the steps. Help me, someone, she sobbed in vain as the ghosts seeped out and pursued her. Audrey shot through the door and threw all her weight against it. The immense barrier of wood slammed shut, and the old latch, far above, snicked shut. The full force of the wraiths fell upon the door with a frightening fury. They hammered and crashed into it, pounding with their fists and shrieking their frustration. Choking back her cries, she raced through the kitchen and into the garden. She had to escape. Fleeing blindly, she ducked under hedges, and round, frost-glimmering sheds. Greenwich, she thought. If only she could somehow find her way through the streets to Greenwich. The Katisak reared high and black above the refugees' heads as they blinked in the light. The mice stared up at the unfamiliar shape of the magnificent vessel in awe. None had ever seen a ship before, and some of them were frightened. But the prospect of staying out in the shivering cold was too dreadful. So they swallowed their fears and entered the clipper cautiously. Thomas led them up a low, dark passage that smelt of tar, but which opened out into an enormous space. He ran up to a white figure wearing a gold turban and ducked into a hole around the back. Now then, he shouted when he emerged again, brandishing his sword. Let's make ourselves a plan of action. But uh, what can we do? asked Master Oldnose doubtfully. 
Well, we can post a watch on deck, for starters. He picked five mice, including Arthur, and he led them up a steep flight of wooden steps. The mice scurried to their designated sentry posts and leaned over the deck rail to stare at the snow-covered ground. Thomas made his way to the prow of the ship and gazed steadily down. Nothing moved over the white expanse. And then a tremendous rumble shook the world, and the cutty sark quivered on its struts. Thomas turned and looked at the mist-enshrouded power station in the distance. Tiny windows were ablaze with white fire, and he could hear a deep purr echo from it. A bolt of jagged blue lightning streaked up from the chimney and sliced through the clouds. With a thundering roar, the towering chimney split, and great chunks of it crumbled away. Into the air rose Jupiter, his vaporous bulk soared and gathered godlike in the sky. A lightning flashed about his head like a crown of cold fire, and in his savage claws something small shone. It was the star glass, and he had one final job for it. Tonight the sun would set for the last time. With a purr that vibrated the air and set all teeth on edge, he rumbled towards Greenwich. Thomas ducked behind the rail as the massive nightmarish shape flew overhead and a dark shadow fell heavily over the ship, plunging it into night. Following beneath their evil master marched the spectral army. The phantoms flourished their ice spears and yammered eagerly for blood. Oh, curse them, swore Thomas. They're surrounding the ship. Sure enough, the ghosts were spreading out, creeping all around the concrete trench that held the trap clipper. They lifted their ghastly faces and let out shrieks of hate. Thomas gripped his sword with determination. I'll not go down without a fight, he told himself. The cackling wraiths licked their lips and moved slowly in. With slow menace, they crept to the edge of the trough, and with frenzied hoots, flung themselves onto the long metal poles that impaled the vessel. They're, they're climbing up, wailed Arthur. Aye, bawled Thomas, keeping us busy while Jupiter flies unhindered to yonder hill. The fiendish army swarmed up furiously. A cruel claw peered over the rim and gouged deeply into the varnished rail. Thomas sprang forward with an angry cry and brought his sword crashing down. The blade sank into the splintering wood, passing clean through the phantom claw which slithered along and hauled its owner up. A snarling ogre of a spirit leapt over the side and landed with an empty chuckle on the deck beside the midship mouse. It was the largest of all the infernal warriors and needed no ice spear, for its claws were long and could rake the wind to ribbons. The terrible claws slashed through the air towards Thomas and streams of ruby blood spurted from the midship mouse's shoulder. Arthur could do nothing to help, for other wraiths had clambered aboard. They jumped gleefully onto the deck, raising their spears and stalking their prey. Three came after Arthur, two went for Master Old Nose, and five charged at Mr. Chitter. More of the gruesome spirits crawled aboard and smacked their insatiable lips. The dome of the Greenwich Observatory distorted, and it buckled as the massive hulking frame of Jupiter descended from the clouds of swirling mist. The building could barely support him, but his iron claws closed over the puny onion shape and sank deeply into the bricks beneath. With hurricane breath he called, Cloud scatter, and reveal unto me the jewel of the day. The sky rippled and slashes tore through the blanketing clouds. With thunder booming to the western horizon, a ragged fracture split the lightning-blasted heavens aside. The pale fingers of mist scudded apart, and there in the breach was the glaring pale disk of the sun. It did not yet dip behind the distant cityscape, and looked down on the observatory like an eye, filled with fear. Jupiter laughed at it. See! Magnificent day star, he bellowed. 
Behold the bringer of your doom. The star glass flashed, and the cat spirit ordered it to obey him. By the charm of the ancient times, I evoke thee, he thundered. Put forth your strength once more. The star glass trembled in his grasp. The lights blazed from it, and with a tremendous shudder, a bolt of silver fire exploded from its heart. A brilliant beam shot out over Greenwich, and it hurtled towards the sun. Oh, now I shall quench thy golden splendor, rumbled Jupiter, as the magic of the glass pierced the atmosphere and travelled through the void faster than light. Extinguish the heats of Rizul, echoed Jupiter's triumphant voice. Plunge all into darkness everlasting. Jupiter laughed, and the hill shook under the observatory. Snow-laden trees splintered and fell, crashing down. Chasms burst open in the rupturing ground, and tons of earth were flung up with the tumult. The world shuddered as darkness started to fall. It was a solid thing that seeped over the land and consumed all light. Numb with cold, beyond fear, beyond hope, Audrey toiled up the ravaged hill towards the observatory. She knew only what she must do now. Perched above her, the towering cliff that was Jupiter crowed with satisfaction. Audrey looked up at the unbeast, but was no longer daunted. She'd been through too much to give in now. Reaching the base of the observatory, she searched for a way up. Mr. Triton! shouted Arthur at the top of his voice. In a circle of spectres, Thomas heard his name and looked up. They've broken into the hold! Arthur called to him. Thomas's face fell. Gwenny! he cried in anguish. He spun round and charged through the gibbering wraiths, slicing one of them in half as he ran. He fought his way out of the battle and sped to the hatch. Arthur met him there, and they descended into the gloom. If those things... Harm a hair of her head, hissed Thomas, leaping down the steps and flexing his sword. Gwen Brown stared fixedly ahead. A ragged slash had been torn in the hull, and through it, greedy phantoms were pouring in. The hundred or so mice backed away, but they were cornered. Mr. Cockle and the other husbands shielded their wives with their bodies as the troops advanced wickedly and waved their claws before them. Ah! Maggot fodder, bellowed a voice in the uproar. We'll beat you yet. Into the hole rushed Thomas and Arthur, shrieking terrible war cries as they ploughed into the centre of the ghosts. Audrey reached up, and her fingers scrabbled for something to hold on to. The walls of the observatory stretched below her as she looked down. Her paws bled from the frost and sharp edges of broken bricks but the balcony that ran round the base of the dome was just a short way off now. Straining and gritting her teeth, she wrenched herself over the edge and rolled onto her back, panting wearily. The vastness of Jupiter towered above her. Clouds of mist wreathed his distant shoulders like a kingly robe, and, and the lightning that burned on his brow shone out like the light from a phantom lighthouse perched on a stupendous mountain. The unbeast was facing west, where the dying sun choked and waned. So intent was his concentration that he did not see the minuscule figure gasping for breath at his feet. Audrey staggered to her feet and took steadying breaths. This was the end of everything for her. She knew that she had to face the cat god and was prepared to die doing so. She had to see Jupiter for one last time and curse him with all her strength. 
A splintered balcony creaked beneath her feet as she walked around. Shh! Hissed a voice from the darkness. Audrey hesitated as round the corner came a pale radiance. It was the light from a flame of starfire. One of Jupiter's ghosts was up there with her. The light grew as the unseen spirit closed on her, and Audrey cried out in horror as the glow lit the ghastly spectre's face. It was Piccadilly! The shade of the city mouse was terrifying. His hair was matted down with guts of black blood, and in his freckled face the sockets of his eyes gaped hollowly. His lips were drawn back over his teeth, which were now sharp and fang-like. He prowled across the balcony and crept nearer. Audrey was too sickened and petrified to move. The wraith spat at her. Piccadilly, she managed to utter. It's me, it's me, Audrey. The ghost snarled and flung itself on her. Audrey wept and struggled, but cold paws found her throat. She looked into the black, empty spaces where the city mouse's eyes had been and, and sobbed. Please, please, Piccadilly, please don't. The ghost squeezed and dug its nails in deeply. Audrey choked and battled for breath. The spectre brought its face close to hers, and from out of the blank sockets tears started to fall and splashed on the girl's cheek. Fight it, Piccadilly! Fight it! she pleaded. The wraith suddenly let go of her and swayed as though hit by an invisible blow. Piccadilly's ghost staggered back and threw its paws over its anguished face. Audrey watched it strive against the star fire that flashed and crackled angrily. You can do it, Piccadilly, she shouted. You can do it! The star fire dwindled, and as the phantom took its paws from its face, Two bright, twinkling eyes gleamed there. Audrey, whispered Piccadilly's shade. The girl nodded and smiled through her tears. Oh, Piccadilly, she sobbed. He looked sadly at her, and she hung her head. I'm so sorry, she cried wretchedly. I, I loved you so much. If only I told you. He did not answer, for at that moment a voice familiar to both of them called softly from the other side. Dilio! Dilio! Audrey looked up and shook her head. Father? She stammered forlornly. A point of light appeared over the balcony. And then it grew larger, and a beautiful glow flooded from it. A flickering blue outline glimmered amidst the shining splendour, and the smiling face of Albert Brown beamed out. It's time you joined me, Gilio, his voice said kindly. Take my paw. Audrey's heart reached out to the spirit of her dead father. Don't go, she called out. Please, Daddy, please. I miss you so. Albert turned to his daughter, and the warmth of his love surged through her tired limbs. Oh, my darling Audrey, he said gently. I'm so proud of you, my little lovely child. The light that framed him began to fade. Tell your mother that I understand and wish her joy. And kiss Arthur for me. I, uh, I have to go now, baby, but we'll meet again one day. I promise. Audrey, she couldn't bear it. The tears streamed down her face and her head ached with the grief that welled up inside. Piccadilly turned to the sobbing girl. Goodbye, he said earnestly. I loved you too. He pressed his phantom lips against hers, and with that kiss he told her more than words ever could. They parted, 
looking into each other's eyes. He merged with the light, and he melted away. She touched the lips that felt the tender, whispering kiss, and fell to her knees. The sun spluttered its last, and with a shattering blast was vanquished. And the giant abhorrence that rejoiced amid the clouds and destroyed any chance of happiness she ever had, and the sense of yearning loss that had overwhelmed her, turned to ice-cold fury and hatred. Jupiter was shaking with vicious laughter as the void devoured the world. Turn and face me! Audrey shouted with all the strength she could muster, her hair streaming about her face as she glared up. Her voice reverberated round the empty sky like thunder and rang in Jupiter's ears. He ceased his black mirth and he peered down. The terrible eyes narrowed as he recognised her. The slayer of his body. An evil smile split his face as he lowered it. White fire ripped from his nostrils and withered the ground around the observatory. Why? Why have you come? He mocked her, and the hail of his breath struck her violently. But Audrey was undaunted. The voice she raised was daring and defiant. I come to call down my destiny, and it is tall and dangerous. Jupiter cackled at the ridiculous figure. Verily, verily shall I deliver unto you thy doom. Meek, and futile though ye be. His gaping maw swept towards her, and with a swift movement she took something from her waistband, a little green shoot that she'd found in the ashes of the star wife's pyre, fluttered in the blizzard as she thrust it before her and into the vicious face that plunged down. The tiny plant unfurled in her paw, and a delicate white flower opened its petals. It was a snowdrop, the herald of spring and the symbol of death. Audrey pulled her arm back and hurled the fragile bloom into the dark throat that had threatened to swallow her. A blaze of emerald fire ignited and burst from the minute flower as it spun down Jupiter's cavernous gullet. The full Unstoppable might of spring was in those flames, and they radiated out gladly as down into the depths of the unbeast's stomach the bright kindling fire tumbled. Jupiter screamed, and his cataclysmic cries convulsed creation. He fell back, stabs of green light slicing through his hellish fur. Witch! Witch! he screeched. What have you done? I curse you. I curse you with all the force of life, answered Audrey gravely. His crown of lightning disappeared as jets of flame steamed out of his ears and he gasped typhoons of emerald smoke and shooting sparks. The great rolling tail smouldered and the ghastly hackles rose as they turned greener than new grass. Jupiter stared at it in horror and brought it lashing down to beat out the enchanted fires that frazzled his fur. The lumbering tail smashed against the fallen trees, and at once the snow melted from their branches, and they exploded into blossom. It cannot be! he roared with agony, as the flames danced around him, and scalding lava poured from his nose. I am Jupiter, mightier than death! I did not condemn you to death, Audrey scorned him, but with the doom of life. The summit of the observatory erupted with flame as the mountainous spirit tottered on the dome, and a furnace of new, purifying growth scourged him. The star glass fell from his iron claws and spiraled down. No! yelled Jupiter. But it was too late. With a resounding smash, it hit the floor and shattered into a million fragments. An enormous rumble shook the world 
as the power of the imprisoned stars escaped. And in a gush of piercing white light, the celestial lamp soared through the night, filling the empty void and electrifying the heavens once more. Jupiter shrieked as the enveloping flame scorched him. I shall escape it! I, I shall! You cannot escape it, Audrey told him solemnly, for you have proved you cannot die. Torture everlasting is your deserved fate, Jupiter. The infernal spirit realized. He realized then that the mouse had conquered him. He was doomed, doomed to be incinerated by eternal spring, but never consumed by it. He burst into a blistering rush of flames and rocketed into the air. Higher and higher he soared into the freezing reaches of space, screeching his pain and his fury. Consigned to the vacuum of the void, he suffered in the agony of spring throughout eternity. Audrey dropped with fatigue, her energy spent. A rosy light glimmered on the horizon as a fresh new day dawned. The golden rays of the reborn sun shone over the dissipating clouds and stretched over the land, ushering in a beautiful morning. On the Cutty Sark, the mice had felt Jupiter roar with anguish and saw the spectres gibber with fear. And when the star glass had shattered, the star fire ripped out of their chests and shot upwards. The phantoms had wavered, bereft of will, and then, with a yowl, each one of the hideous fiends crackled and disappeared. Thomas gaped in amazement, and the mice hugged each other and cried with relief. Arthur held on to his mother, and she kissed him. And then suddenly, a marvellous sight greeted their eyes. The hold was filled with luscious greenery, and flowers shone like the sun. Sparkling lights shimmered and clustered round figureheads, and the hold was a forest of burnished gold and twinkling emerald, and there, in the centre, was the green mouse wore a crown of leaves and wheat, and his eyes were filled with the light of sun-dappled glades. The mice bowed. The hallowed spirit of spring and summer beamed, and the hold was flooded with warmth. Audrey crept wearily in through the hole in the ship's side, and the green mouse bowed his head in reverence his green mane cascading over his shoulders. Very great you have grown, my little one, he said in his deep, rich voice, and wise beyond measure. You alone are responsible for this glad day, and my release, he inclined his head and kissed her. Audrey shook her head. Well, it wasn't me, she piped up. It, it was the star wife, really. I, I think she sacrificed herself to create the snowdrop. The deep, fathomless eyes twinkled at her. You? Her? Uh, she? All are one now. So, I thank you. Audrey looked puzzled for a moment, and then she smiled. Yes. Yes, she said. Audrey then looked at her mother and at Thomas and grinned. Yeah, I, I know what's in your heart, she said. Father knows too, and he wishes you both happiness. You belong together now. Gwen glanced at Thomas and then Audrey, and then blushed and looked at her feet. The green mouse laughed. Come, Mrs. Brown. 
I give you my blessing. He turned to Thomas and he told him, You are a lucky mouse, seafarer. Thomas blinked, and then he blushed too. Harry, I, I reckon so, he mumbled sheepishly. And so the green mouse married them, and the glorious spring sunshine filled the hold and lived in their hearts until the end of their days. The bounteous time lasted for many months, and in those splendid days the mice remained on the Katisark and made oh, comfortable homes for themselves there. After some weeks had passed, several mice, led by Arthur, returned to the empty house in Deptford. But the damage inflicted by Jupiter's army could not be repaired and they had to load all the useful items they could find into sacks and take them to the ship. Audrey had travelled with them, and while Arthur and the others were inspecting the wreckage and tutting at the devastation, she slipped into the cellar and hunted until she found what she sought. On a moonless May night, when the stars blazed in the heavens, she took leave of her family and made her way up the hill to the overgrown chambers of the old squirrel colony. With the starlight burning on her brow, she took a small pendant from the pocket of her dress and held it up to the celestial lamps. A white fire flickered over the silver acorn in her paw. And then Audrey tied it round her neck, and her beauty was that of another world. With a sad smile on her lips, she became the new star wife, handmaiden of Orion.